Today is the 26th of September 2022 and this is a conversation between Emilio Longo and Fiona Bilbra. Fiona, welcome to School Based Art, a learning resource for art students and artist teachers. Thank you very much for inviting me into your studio today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. You're most welcome. Great. Thanks, Fiona. Well, let's begin with a biographical overview. Fiona, you were born in 1967 in Melbourne, Australia. You're a prominent Australian realist painter who was trained in the methods of the Max Meldrum School of Tonal Realism. Known predominantly for your work in still life and portraiture, you are a frequent applicant to portrait prizes in Australia, receiving the Gordon Moffat Award in 2001, 2002 and 2003, as well as winning the Victorian Artist of the Year Award in the same years. Additionally, you won the McCubbin Medal for Best in Show at the Rotary Club of Box Hill's White Horse Art Show in 2006, as well as winning the prestigious AME Bail Scholarship in 1995. Your work has been published in Australian Artists Magazine in 1996, 1997 and 2004. In 2016, you were admitted as a member to the 20 Melbourne Painter Society and you were also a member of the Victorian Artist Society and Melbourne Society of Women Painters and Sculptors. Your paintings are featured in private collections in France, Italy, Spain, England, Scotland, and throughout Australia. Your academic background includes a Bachelor of Education in Fine Arts from the University of Melbourne, which you received in 1990. Between 1989 and 1990, you underwent private tuition with the late Australian painter and student of Max Meldrum, John Balmain, in portraiture and still life painting. Subsequently, in 1996 to 1997, you had a grand tour of Europe, studying the art of the European masters intensively. Fiona, beginning with your early years, how were you exposed to art as a child? Did you come from a creative family? And were you surrounded by art whilst growing up? Very good question. Um, I have a grandmother who was very much into dressmaking and, in fact, she was um, one of the head tailors to the Queen Mother. She was working at Norman Hartnell. Um, My grandfather was always very encouraging. I I can't say I had a flair. Um, I'm thinking more my direction towards the arts happened actually probably towards the end of secondary school and really cemented itself when I met John Balmain, my teacher. Um, I did have lessons at McClelland Guild in Lang Warren when I was about 10 years of age and my mum paid for me to have a whole term of lessons with this Mr Balmain. Sure. Um, As it turns out, um, a good, mm, gosh, 10 years down the track, um, I arrive on the doorstep of Mr. Balmain um, to meet him. And uh, it was actually to do a portrait of somebody known in arts, letters and science. I see. And it, it was an invitation through the university I was studying at. And I, thinking back, who, could I, who do I know? I couldn't think of anybody except the Mr. Balmain when I was 10. So I spoke to this person on the phone, we organised the appointment and then I arrive at his door to see this really elderly man with a long beard, beret, glasses and a cap hanging around his neck. (laughs) And I realised very quickly that he'd either aged significantly or it was a different Mr Balmain. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out it was his son that was to give me lessons when I was 10 at McClellan Guild. Um, I didn't last very long though. I believe I went back and said to my mum, I don't like being told what to do. And subsequently, I don't think I finished the the course. But um, I did remember this young Mr. Balmain. And to be honest, he probably, today he looks like the John Balmain that I learnt from. Mm -hmm. He's still practicing as well. So so this is yeah. this is the son of John. The son of yeah. was the person who was to teach me when I was ten. Wow! So then I meet John Balmain um, around. Well, I was about nineteen, I suppose. And as soon as I met him, I just I just adored him. The cat around his neck, and I'm a cat person. Mm-hmm. Um, the paintings that lined the floor to ceiling, three and four deep, to, as wow. you walk down the hall. Uh, you know, and he met me at the door and I instantly knew 
I was in the presence of greatness and that I needed to listen to this man. He did appear quite elderly, as I said, and I always felt like he might not be here for very long and therefore the the knowledge that he's got, there's only a, a short window of time to get as much information as I possibly could. And he was very, very generous. He he actually invited me to join his class even though he was folding the classes up and retiring. Um, but we got along so well at, during that first time meeting. Um, I was actually doing a portrait of him. Um, and then to this day I still can't believe what I produced, but he obviously saw something in it and he said, you know, I'm closing the school down. Would you like to join? I can have one space available for you and I couldn't say yes fast enough so <laughs> from then on for two years it was um, every Tuesday night for two and a half to three hours um, typically we'd go longer and we'd arrive earlier and it was quite the gathering every Tuesday night I know he had a class on another night but I think ours was the the really serious class sure sure so, yeah. yeah that sounds like a really inspiring experience for a young Very much. art student definitely I was really impressionable and my understanding of great art was what I had seen at the National Gallery in Melbourne, probably as a primary school student taken in for the day to the National Gallery. And as a youngster, I would have been drawn to the stuff I could relate to, being you know, the realistic, impressionistic looking works, not the modern conceptualised abstract work. So my affinity towards traditional has been there a long time, but um, most mostly engineered through the path of meeting John Belmain. Sure. Fantastic. Now, coming back to your early years, Fiona, did your parents and school teachers notice that you had an affinity with drawing and painting from a young age? I wouldn't say I had an affinity. I wasn't bad, but I don't think I would have been somebody that would have gone, oh, she couldn't draw. Um, I think I just enjoyed being in the art room at at primary and high school. Um, I don't think I was probably good enough at the other subjects I would have liked to have done. I'd love to have been a vet, no good at maths and science, So, and my um, literacy is not hot enough to be a lawyer or a doctor. Mm-hmm. But I, I kind of fell into the path of the arts because I felt comfortable, not not too out of my depth. Mm-hmm. And it, there was such a lot of variety. When I, when I went to uni, we had 13 prac subjects in first year finalised down to the major of painting in the fourth year. So there's a lot of room to negotiate what path I wanted to do. And, of course, my university degree led me to a Bachelor of Education. So um, lots of doors can be opened from that perspective if you've got the educational certificate at the end. But the prac experience in all those different crafts was ideal to, for me to hone in on what I really loved doing. Sure, sure. Now, can you recall any moments from your childhood when you felt content that you wanted to become an artist and begun to take art seriously? Well, that's interesting as well. I wouldn't say that I focused on being an artist any younger than, say, towards the end of my high school, other than as a child in primary school we used to do this pilgrimage holiday Christmas time down to Pambula Beach and I remember seeing a lady painting on the beach every year she was there and every year I would make sure I got to watch this gorgeous lady Valerie and she was so friendly and I just was amazed I'm thinking there's a real artist on the beach mom god I want to go and watch I want to go and watch not thinking that that might have an effect on me in the future. Mm -hmm. It was just in that moment every year I just looked forward to going and seeing what Valerie had been painting. Sure. And she did, she gave a few tips that I now realise came from her. One of them was to put viridian in a Mm -hmm. sky. Mm -hmm. And um, quite often I've seen students painting skies and they're they're way out and I say to them, pop a bit of viridian in and they look at me and go, what, that'll make it green. <laughs> and I just remember she had to have the viridian and, it, and I loved her paintings back then. Um, she still paints today and I, I don't think I've seen anything recently though, but, yeah, her personality was a lot like John Balmain's, sure. very um, grandparent-like and it, it just for an adult to accommodate my curiosity like that I thought that was really, really sweet. Oh, that's great. So So this particular lady that you met painting on a beach 
Do you, do you know what particular lineage she came from regarding her painting lineage? No, I believe she was self-taught. But, um, I mean, everybody who says they're self-taught, we're all influenced by different people. Yeah. Um, even just going to a gallery and seeing a, um, a one-off, you know, blockbuster exhibition can leave its trademark on you. And, sure. You know, we, we take snippets of this, snippets of that. I might like the way another artist uses a palette knife in a landscape painting and I think, hang on, I'm going to translate some of that. I'm going to try and have a crack at that in my portrait work. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the various historic masters that we all aspire to or have aspired to at some time or other that perhaps introduced us to art, like The Night Watchman by Rembrandt. In primary school, that would have been one of the posters on the, the wall in the art room. Sure. So, I mean, yeah, though, I remember probably those posters more than I remember what a science lesson was about <laughs> or a maths lesson. Um, yeah, my relationship with education is more on the visual mm -hmm. than the literary yeah. aspect. You're a visual learner. Visual learner by, for, for sure. Sure, yeah. sure. In 1986, you began teaching oil painting at the McClellan Guild of Artists to students with varying degrees of knowledge. How did you come to be a teacher at the McClellan Guild of Artists? Mm. It was quite an exciting part of my life. I was fairly naive, um, I guess, at that stage. I just finished my high school years. Um, I was just about, uh, I was sort of introduced through John Balmain as a result, as a consequence of my having two years tuition from him. So Tuesday nights for two years. In the middle of my university degree, while still attending John Belmain's classes, I took a year off, mm. not quite knowing what I was going to do. And I can remember the um, the university going at one end of my head and my views of what I firmly agreed with with John Belmain were coming in from the other direction. And it was a bit of a tug of war going on. Mm. Um, there was this idea of big is better and it shouldn't take that long. Why look at the old masters? That's boring. It's all been done before. I'm so appalled by that attitude that I believe still runs today. Um, I think the foundation of all training lies in a thorough understanding of the basics. And I think that there's a big gap in our education system within the painting departments, what is expected to have been learnt before you arrive at university and what has been achieved in high school. Um, I, I would often find that students are floundering, not knowing their direction, and they're majoring in a painting course, but they still haven't got a real direction. And I think there's that comes from the previous teachers they've had, what experience they had, what their passions were and what they felt they could offer mm -hmm. to the students. Then you've also got to stick within the curriculum. Absolutely. So what I do in my studio here isn't necessarily anything you'd find in a high school. It's, the setup is so precise and considered that it's not possible to set it up for a class of 28 kids. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, which is why I love having the young ones here when I can. Um, back in my previous studio, I used to have junior classes and they would start with children that were tall enough to see onto the bench. So they're <laughs> generally around 12 and up. Um, they, I can get them working on still life pretty early and they could pick it up, pick it up really, really quickly. That's great. Yeah. That's much fantastic. Better. And they're open to all the challenges that portraiture will give them, black and white cast painting, um, yeah, it used to take the kids away on plein air trips. One particular one up to Castle Maine was quite quite a revelation. They they really loved it and they, I think all of them grew up quite substantially on that trip and, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. But just because they're young doesn't mean they can't learn Absolutely. this process. This process is a learned skill. Mm -hmm. It's not a gift. It's not something you're born with. You acquire the skill Absolutely. And if you um, have someone in your family that can uh, assist with your desire to to get some understanding of this, then, you know, you've got a bit of support. If you don't have any support, you, it is quite lonely. You can feel like you're just on this journey yourself and the end result, um, you know, we're, we're, we're grateful if somebody likes what we do and they're, if they're happy to pay money for it, even better. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm even to this day, I'm always shocked that people will pay money mm -hmm. for what I do. 
um, it kind of feels like such a privilege. Sure, it does. But, but yeah. I, I actually enjoy the process far more than the end result. I'm Absolutely. never happy with the end result because mm-hmm. I've already got the picture finished before I started and I've, and as I'm doing it, that image is growing <laughs> and I, I get really quite excited when I think it's going down the right track. Absolutely. But, um, every, you know, every painting offers its own challenges but if you don't enjoy the journey, then if you take up another hobby. Sure. Well, it's, I've heard you mention it before. It's the chase that you yeah. really love. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That idea that you can m- manipulate someone's brain to thinking they're seeing something which they're really not. It's mm-hmm. just a two-dimensional image. You squirt this stuff out of a tube, liquid, and you put it together and, bam, it comes out apricots on a bench with a blue vase or something. And it, it's kind of this hypnotic um, bizarre, I don't know if it's existentialist, but you feel like you're getting into people's heads. Absolutely. You're really messing with your head when mm-hmm. I put something on the wall that I've painted and you walk past and I see you stop and I think, ah, got him. That's right. I've actually entered into your psyche for that brief moment. It's really incredible. It's uh, it's almost like, uh, you know, alchemy or, or magic yeah. or something like that, yeah. isn't it, when you think about it? Yeah. Yeah, great. Now, the McCallum Guild of Artists has quite a unique history, which goes back to the 1970s. I understand John Balmain was a teacher in the Guild, and his influence led to the formation of the Guild's founding committee. Did you first meet John whilst you were teaching at the Guild? No. (laughs) It was John Balmain that actually got me the job. Um, I just graduated from university, and... I was umming and ahhing about going into a primary or secondary school to teach full time and I still felt like I I had other things I'd like to have investigated but it was actually um, John Balmain had said to to me previously, just go get that bit of paper because you'll use it one day. You you might want to paint all the time and make that your sole career but things change Mm -hmm. and luckily I had his support and his foresight to see that, you know, throughout history, things are changing so quickly. Like sure. Painting today um, for a market is completely different to what it was in the 1970s when exhibitions would open and every painting had a red dot on it, mm-hmm. you know, before the end of the night. I think with technology the way it is and everyone's an expert photographer with their mobile phones in hand, mm-hmm. um, to, to be able to succeed at being an artist today is I would say considerably harder than it would have been oh, in the past. Most definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. What are some of the memories you have from your time teaching in the Guild? As I understand, you remained there for nine years, finishing in 1995. Yes, I finished um, just after I completed my, or just uh, from my win of the scholarship, actually, that I won 1995. Um, before winning that, though, those students that I was teaching were all primary school aged. Um, there's primary school up to 16 and then it switched over to the adult classes. So okay. um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the young children's classes. They're very, very impressionable and they don't know any different when they come so young. It's, I like getting people who are beginners, so obviously that's going to include the, the kids. But beginners don't come in with a preconceived idea and they don't come in with other teachers' input mixing it up with the recipe that I use, which is the Meldrum formula. Um, The kids literally do what you say, um, but a thousand times more. So if I say to them, what's the difference between that and that, they'll go, well, this is darker, duh. Mm. And I'm like, "Uh aha, so yours is too light or too dark? And I can say, back off a little, and they'll go straight to it. Whereas an adult, I say, make it a bit darker. They're like the most minute little dark and go nowhere near it, nowhere near it. And you spend half an hour waiting for them to get to the right darkness. Yeah. Whereas the kids, they come in and go black. <laughs> and you say, right, back it off a bit. And yeah. you get to the result faster with kids, mm-hmm. um, which is a shame because a lot of people take up painting when they retire. Right. And That's after, true. say, 65, there might be eyesight deterioration, um, grandkids to babysit, um, partners or um husbands, wives are sick and they've mm-hmm. got to stay home or transport to and from. They become the grandparents' taxi. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things that interfere with the smooth 
um, Absolutely. program of tuition that is required. So the kids, that, that mum pays up, mum and dad pay the fees for the term, they're here every week. That's it, so, yeah. But that's back at McClellan days, of course. Right. Um, yeah, um, of late I'm more or less painting for myself and for the annual exhibition I'm part of, the 20 Melbourne. Sure. And rotary shows. Yeah. But, of course, COVID kind of knocked everything on the head, including all my classes. They just went to, to kaput. Yeah. Um. And the shows haven't really started back quite as strong. They're, I think the um, sponsors maybe haven't come back on board or we're looking at new sponsors. The Rotary Clubs, there's so many causes they need to raise money for. Mm-hmm. So um, prize money's, you know, not as not as good as it used to be. But like I said, if you don't enjoy the chase, it's... What's the point? Yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. Yeah. In 1989, you began training in the principles and methods of the Max Meldrum School of Tonal Realism with John Balmain. What made you decide that John would be the right teacher for you? Now, you've, you've mentioned somewhat yeah, already yeah. why you chose John. Well, Is there anything like to add to that? Um, do you know, I, I didn't find any other person mm. that was going to influence me. It, it was actually that meeting of John through my years at university with that um request for an entry to a portrait prize but it wouldn't have mattered if I'd met others after I'd met John Balmain no one could have swayed me from the teachings that he gave me sure Uh, and I did come to grief a little bit with the university lecturers in that I had this idea that I wanted to do traditional I, I couldn't get my head around the conceptual abstract painting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even today I don't I don't ever go down that direction I can appreciate the really good abstract work I can appreciate um, you know Picasso's drawings that um, you know there's a whole lot of artists that are uh, abstract artists but I want to see their training mm-hmm. coming through in their work they've mm-hmm. got to be good draftsmen they've got to have a control of um, thin to thick paint mm-hmm. you know the way paint behaves is crucial and if it's not if there's no variety in the application or a variety in the brushwork, um, to me it's it's full short. Sure. So. And, and going back to those years, Fiona, when you did discover John Balmain, um, you know, for a student that was interested in learning to paint traditionally, was it tough to find a teacher? I reckon it would have been almost impossible back wow. then because a lot of the teachers that were teaching in high school or university we're trying to direct their students down an abstract, more modern approach. Like we're talking 70s and 80s. Wow. Um, you know, it was trendy to be doing modern abstract work. And if, in my naive head, all I could think of was the, the, it's decor art. They yeah. Just, they just yeah. say, what are the themes of the colour this year? What are we into? What is it blues and browns? Or, and I'm thinking, I couldn't care less. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I just want to paint. I want to learn how to do this properly. Sure. And there was always that battleground of, well, why do you want to do that? It's all been done before. Mm-hmm. And I just, well, I haven't done it before, and I really want to learn how they got to that result. Sure. So sure. it might be, um, um, you know, boring to everybody else, but I have. I felt like there was a need. I had to go down to that base roots. Ground, grassroots and then work my way up. Sure. So that's fairly confronting to the lecturers at uni who've got a strict curriculum they have to stick to. Mm-hmm. It doesn't involve 18th, 19th century work. So, Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's a story that we're, we're all too familiar uh, with. It's sad, isn't it? And even today, it's the traditional works, the academic methods, they're not um, appreciated, you know, for what they were. And they should basically form the, you know, the ground for every artist. We've got to have those basic skills, basic uh, visual observation skills. And without those, um, I don't know, I feel like there should be another name for it, not, mm-hmm. not painting as such or graphic communication is probably more along the line. Mm-hmm. Illustration, there's a lot of people that do replications of photographs. Sure. You know, even that's a completely different ball game mm. to this sort of work. Yes, absolutely. So I'm is. not against it. I use it myself on occasions when needed. But, um, you know, that foundation of being able to understand how we interpret things that are 3D onto a 2D surface, 
by squirting this liquid stuff out of a tube. You know, that's that's what excites me. Absolutely. That's, that's what I love seeing the penny drop in other people and they they watch a demo and they go, I think I can do that. Mm -hmm. I think I can do that. Mm -hmm. And then giving them the tools and watching that light bulb go off. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's that's why I do what I do. Absolutely. It's lovely to pass it on as yeah, well. Once yeah. you attain the craft yeah. to pass it on. Yeah. Sure. Can you explain the course of training that John had prescribed for you? Definitely. Um, paint what you see, not what you know. Okay. Um, if in doubt, leave it out and um, don't touch that canvas unless you have a good reason to. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of things he used to say um, that he used to have this constant, I had this hear him in the background going slow down what's the hurry what's the hurry yeah step back is that right and it, it, he'd make me go for another take i had to he'd actually make me second guess myself which mm. meant that i hadn't studied the thing i was meant to be striking for so i can remember him walking up and down the row of easels and i could hear his footsteps coming and i'm thinking he's coming he's coming quick is it good enough is it good enough i just want to make sure it's good Oh, what was I supposed to be doing? And then he'd come back and he'd say, now what about this area just here? And I said, I was just about to do that. Mm. And he'd go, sure you were. <laughs> and it was about, I don't know, he was quite, um, he had this air of expertise about him. Sure. And, but he delivered his message so sensitively that any beginner could understand him. Mm -hmm. And I just appreciated that he took me on when he did, when he was retiring, um, and I think that's what I try to translate that into the, the youngsters that I used to teach. So whatever John taught me, I was the, to pass that on. And hopefully when, you know, the students that I've taken on, there's quite a few of them now that are teaching art themselves. So um, those that were in my classes back then at McClellan Guild have, I think every single one of them has gone on to really great things. They've oh, all got fantastic. degrees and their qualifications are you know, fairly highly sought. That yeah, they're great at everything they do. That's fantastic. So, so with um, with your training with John, did he start you with uh, copying plaster casts early on? Plaster casts was the first thing we did. Um, they could get a lot get boring quite easily, mm. but he was really good at mixing it up and being able to pick when we were bored or when we were struggling with a concept that we didn't understand. Um, he's, a lot of teaching was done through his own demonstrations on an easel next to ours. Um, books, there was always books on the tables. Um, underneath an easel there's a book of an artist might be, um, pardon me, um, oh, Velasquez's portrait and you might be saying, well, you're on a portrait this week and he's got a Velasquez book out. Yeah. And it's a detailed of a nose and you're thinking, oh, Thanks, John. You know, you know he, he knew mm -hmm. how to get into our heads sure. without actually even saying anything. Sure. It could be, or he'd just say, I want you to have a look at that one up there and have a look at the edges around that top of the forehead. Yeah. And that's all he had to say. And he yeah. made us look for the information. Mm -hmm. so I always appreciate that it was his teaching was about making us see. Sure. And trusting what we see, not going back to what we thought we knew what you knew yeah, yeah absolutely what are the key points you took away from your two years working with john and how have they impacted your work well the lighting i have to say the lighting the way he had his house lit up yeah the entire house was a studio including the bathroom um just i was fascinated by the whole house it wasn't a palace or anything and it was a tiny little house but it was filled with so much knowledge it was filled with animal like cats and it had the he had paintings everywhere cameras everywhere for photographing his work in progress the bathroom had flowers in it that someone had sent around for him to paint and wow. sometimes <laughs> they hadn't got up on the bench they just ended up in the trash um, the books that he had lying around everywhere i was influenced literally by everything in his house mm -hmm. I, I just knew there was no one else like john mm -hmm. that was I just adored him. I still see him. I can hear his voice even now just saying, slow down, what's the hurry? Mm -hmm. And But I can also hear him saying to the next person, 
might want to speed up a little bit there. Sure. Uh, and uh, I was I would listen to everything that he said to everybody. Sure. Uh, my radars were going. Yeah, uh, uh, the best though was when we got to see him paint. Yeah. So very rarely he would do a demonstration on someone's work. Okay. But he would have his work next to it, and we'd see him do a little bit, and we'd go, oh, "It makes it look so easy." Yeah, sure. But he's yeah, it was just he was charming in every way, gentle. Um, very encouraging. He never said a bad word to anybody. If he, if he didn't like what you were doing, it might be a, hmm, okay. Well, um, now how do you think we can work this area here instead of saying that's wrong? Mm -hmm. And it was always positive. Um, yeah. Sounds like yeah. a great man. Very nice. I think they broke the mould for art teachers <laughs> when he died. Yeah. I understand you maintain contact with John even after you completed your formal training with him. In fact, he would often give you feedback on your paintings. John unfortunately passed in 2000. Can you explain what your relationship with John was like after finishing your course of study with him? Yes, well, John mentored me for another 10 years or more after that. He didn't actually like giving up his teaching. It was sort of something that happened through his health. But I know he had a handful of favourite students that really he knew took him very seriously and he kept in contact with us. We needed each other really. I needed his information and his friendship was just the bonus really. But the most beautiful thing I can remember was John's personality mm. and the, the sensitivity that he had. I'd never met an adult male that had that affinity with you know people's emotions and and to be able to judge who was struggling who wasn't struggling mm -hmm. when to push someone you know to raise the bar a bit more when to back away when to get somebody off something that they were obsessed with and try and manipulate them over to another subject they were going to get more benefit sure um yeah i think i just i just so look forward to seven o'clock on a tuesday night i drive over um, from Frankston to Dandenong and I had heard, you know, people at my university had said, why do you drive all that far, that that distance? Yeah. You don't need to. I'd say, yes, I do. I, I want the best. I've, yeah. I've got the best. I would not set a, settle for anybody less. Mm -hmm. And when I won my scholarship, John was very, very um, strong in regard to where do I go to study because the, the scholarship was to go and study overseas. Mm -hmm. Um, back then there was a formula that most artists copied where you studied at the Florence Academy or um, Daniel Gray's studios in Florence. It was really mostly about, about being in Italy and I had found this teacher online, um, showed him to John Balmain. They had a bit of a discussion on the phone back then and it was agreed that this person would be the best person for me to go to, mm -hmm. that I would have... A, a, a training background from this gentleman that was not unlike that of John Balmain. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, um, it didn't quite pan out as we'd hoped because there was some um, relational issues with this teacher and I had to um, change my program significantly. But okay. um, I still believe this person was a fantastic teacher. He, he set up a wonderful school in Florence Um yeah, and I just think every my study at that academy was interesting because it opened my eyes in the way the other half live and the I hadn't been, you know, travelling the world before and for me to go into another culture where I didn't speak the language. Um, yeah, I left Australia with no foreign language skills whatsoever sure. and a year away. Yeah, it was quite it was quite character building. Right. But, you know, the painting was the familiar territory. So going to the studio um, in Borgo San Frediano was my that was my safety blanket for mm. a long time and then you know I decided it, my scholarship should be served by copying the masters sure equally you know by other than just looking and taking instruction from one other person sure now this particular teacher you mentioned you've kept him anonymous is it important to share oh I think he's a brilliant brilliant teacher yes i can um it's charles cecil and yeah. he has his own school yeah um he has the school in boston as well mm -hmm. over in the states mm -hmm. very very good instructor he mm -hmm. produces amazing students 
but unfortunately I didn't get to see enough of him. It was just the timing, unfortunately, sure. and things yeah. happened. Um, but that was character building in itself. I was scheduled to have classes with him and it didn't happen, so I ended up studying in all the galleries over there and doing sure. copy master copy work. Um, the experience of being at the, you know, that age, about 19, when I mean, it teaches resilience and it teaches you to be able to to adapt and change. And, you know, I left Australia very naive and I came back with this attitude of, well, I can get on a plane tomorrow and be in America, yeah. you know, hours later. I can actually do it. Whereas before that, as I, I'd still say I was in that childlike mindset that, um, you know, I don't know if I could do it. I don't, you know. There's yeah. a lot of things you fear when you're younger and mm-hmm. that now in, in my mid-50s I, I'm disappointed that I let fear hold me back quite a bit, you know, for a lot of things. And mm-hmm. re- winning that scholarship was really life-changing for me because sure. I got to do things that I didn't think I could do mm-hmm. at an age when I was probably, um, you know, naive and immature mm-hmm. and I came back with my eyes wide open. Right, yeah. yeah. But so- I, I didn't suffer fools very well when I came back. I, I felt like I've been here, been there, done that. Yeah. And I couldn't tolerate people talking crap. I just, yeah, I was more obsessed with painting when mm-hmm. I came back. Sure. I, I was obsessed before I went, but I was a thousand times more when I came <laughs> back and I couldn't wait to go again. Mm-hmm. You know, going incredible. going from, oh, I've just been awarded the scholarship, I'm going to be leaving Australia for 12 months, <laughs> oh, I'm scared, <laughs> to... Um, I want to go again. I've got sure. a taste of it and it, once you get a taste, and it's quite addictive. Right, right. Well, it really sounds like you developed your independence during yeah. that time as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. From 1988 onwards, you were a contract art teacher and artist in residence in a number of schools. Can you explain more about this period of your life and how you found teaching art in a school environment? Well, the school environment's vastly different to a studio environment. Um, I was trained to teach high school and I ended up uh, teaching primary school age children uh, after uh, a teacher from a primary school came to me privately for lessons. Um, What generally happened was I would have a few students to my private studio at home for painting, Mm -hmm. oil painting, still life and portrait work, and inevitably they would have their family come and have lessons as well. So it might be Mm. a wife and then their husband comes along, they want to paint as well, or they have uh, a granddaughter that wants to learn to paint or they're heading down that path, Fiona, would you introduce them to the studio? Sure. So, um, yeah, I'd say primary school kids, I, I, I didn't mind teaching in a public school setting. Mm. I didn't generally like teaching in the art room as much, though. I I felt the pressure that the class must produce because everybody would say, oh, they've got Fiona for this class, so we'll just, Fiona can do an art class with them. But it's not the same. You know, what you do in a class in a school environment is so different, and I I wish we could do more of this kind of work as the foundation training Mm -hmm. for school. But it takes a lifetime to learn. and. You can't teach when you've only got the children for sometimes it's 45 minutes a class. It could be as little as that. Um, it's not enough to do no. the, this work in there. But when I have had those students come to me privately, they have gone through the roof with their training. They Absolutely. go very far, very fast. Mm-hmm. And as I said, they just grab hold of it and run. Yeah. So yeah, it's, well. it's very different. And school, school environment's not quite... Um, adaptable enough to do this kind of work. Absolutely. Simple things just like, you know, keeping your work in one place. It's very hard when you're in a school environment and you've got, you're dealing with periods and lessons and uh, shared classrooms. Well, imagine setting a still life up and only to find that that there's been 12 classes between your class and the last one and the next one and your subject's been moved or someone's shifted the lights. Yeah. Um, and I'm a great believer that I don't want to teach in an environment that I wouldn't want to work in myself sure. from a painting studio perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, the school teaching that I used to do in the public education system was anything from prep to grade six yeah. and then and a few years I did up to year 10. But um, 
I enjoyed the interaction with the kids and I learned a lot from them as well. Mm-hmm. I, I, I firmly believe these young ones taught me how I today explain things to my adults. Right, yeah. So that idea that I have to speak to um, a 14-year-old in a young person's dialogue mm-hmm. It works equally as well to translate that up to teaching adults. Adults are not offended if you say, what's the difference between that? Is yours darker or lighter? Mm -hmm. It's a language they understand. Mm -hmm. It's day-to-day language. As soon as you start putting, um, you know, huge literary text next to what it is you're trying to look at to be able to understand it, we've lost a lot of people. That's right. You know, if I have to explain it for too long, um, they're not going to get the message. You know, mm-hmm. It's a visual subject. What we're doing, this is a, it's a visual game, yeah. an illusion. Mm. But there are things that we all know we see similarly. Sure, we don't know that we all see color the same. Mm-hmm. The tones, we can tell if we're seeing tones the same. Mm-hmm. And the reason I say that is, if you take a black and white photo of anything you've painted. If it still works and it looks good in a black and white, you can say that the tones are working. They're yeah. correct. Mm-hmm. You can do whatever you like with color. But if the tone's correct, it should interpret in black and white. Absolutely. So that's um, kind of the the assessment for whether somebody's working tonally. But kids, they don't often understand this language of what the word tone is. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you say chroma for the color or hue, a variation of that color, the kids don't understand it. Mm-hmm. Neither do a lot of adults. Right. That they they get if you say is yours lighter or darker? Is yours is that warmer or cooler? Yeah. You know, there's a language barrier, you know, from these people who are hobby painters to the ones that are taking it seriously. Sure. Uh, and I, I'm very grateful for the years that I had teaching at McClelland with those youngsters particularly. We had a, a hell of a lot of fun. We travelled a lot mm-hmm. together. The parents would drop them off and we'd fill up a trailer with easels and paints <laughs> and boxes, sleeping bags, and we'd head off and find um, some cabins in a caravan park somewhere and go and paint. And their energy was so contagious. Mm -hmm. I can say if I did the same thing with a lot of adults, by the time I've been set up, so by the time we we get all to one spot and we set up, I've actually almost finished a painting. Yeah. And the kids would keep pace with me. Great. I mean, they might not have been 100% accuracy, but, boy, were they they knew what it was about, that that energy behind working from life that creates that... um, like you say, an alchemy on the canvas. Mm -hmm. There's a fluency that comes when you've got confidence and there's confidence that comes when you put the hours in and the brush miles. Yeah, absolutely. So the kids were there every Thursday night religiously. That's Their parents had paid for their lessons, so they were attending. Yeah. But but they just loved it. That sounds great. And then they didn't leave. And when they went on to different levels in their high school and stuff, then they'd already have a younger sibling Mm -hmm. to take their place. Yeah, yeah. I had a a good relationship with the families for a long time. That sounds great. And and you're correct in saying that when you're teaching – uh, it really gets you to think about, um, well, you're really practicing your metacognition or you're, Absolutely. you're thinking about your thinking and how would I yeah. go about explaining something that clearly makes sense to me yeah. to someone that's, you know, 10 or someone yeah. that's 15 or yeah. an adult that's 30, so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah, that replication of that, what I say, do, don't, um, sorry, if you, I want them to, pra- to practice doing what I'm doing mm-hmm. as well as what I'm saying. Sure. So I need to be able to demonstrate what I've just said. Mm-hmm. And as I said, we're often, you know, visual learners and being demonstrated to is a faster way to learn something than if someone gave you a book to read. Absolutely. Uh, and, the, and painting, it to me, is one of these subjects you can't just read a book no. and then instantly you become a good painter. That's right. I, I liken it to swimming and mm-hmm. horse riding, which were my past as well. I say you can't give a 10-year-old, a book on how to swim that's never been in the pool. That's right. And read the book and then off they go. They, they don't. No. You can't put a person on a horse that's never been on a horse. That's true. And they've watched Saddle Club for, mm. for a couple of years. No, they still can't ride. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a learned skill and I, I stre- you've got to have the right teacher. Absolutely. And then there's a bit of luck that you're there at the right time as well because – there can be stages in your life where you're not open to learning and taking on new stock in the brain. Mm. Um, and for me, at you know, 19, I was like a sponge. 
yeah. to John Balmain's teachings, mm-hmm. not anybody else's. I certainly wasn't a sponge to my university teachers. Sure. Um, I was almost, it was almost like they were polar to each other. Mm-hmm. But it changed, it changed me and made me really mature about how I judge everything in life. Sure. So John taught me to do this comparison all the time between things. Mm-hmm. So it might be between the subject or between those people or between what that book I've just re- been told to read was about. Um, oh, I've read an article in the paper. Oh, it's an exhibition, a blockbuster exhibition that's mm. coming. But I'm thinking, oh, compared to what I'm doing in John Balmain's studio, it's not my blockbuster. Mm-hmm. It's not the direction I want to go. You know, sure. there's so many variables. Right. But trying to get into those brains of people, youngsters particularly, is you know, it's it's a valuable thing they, they get. If we can take them down this path, the knowledge they learn in the studio is um, used throughout the rest of their life. Absolutely. The, the is, ability yeah. to be comparing things all the time mm-hmm. and not second-guessing things, just get it right, mm-hmm. check, double-check. Um, how does it relate to something else? You mm-hmm. know, that's... It's a foundation in visual observation, but also the brain's ability to make a comparative analysis. Absolutely. And even in in problem solving, looking at the big picture and then breaking it down to the next set of problems Mm -hmm. and the next set of problems, that's um, applicable to, it's widely applicable to various aspects in one's life as well. Yeah. Yeah. Process of elimination. Right. Exactly. Exactly. In 1990, you engaged with a Bachelor of Education in Fine Arts from the University of Melbourne. By this point, you had already been teaching at the McClellan Guild of Artists for four years and had spent two years teaching art in various schools. What led to the decision of needing a degree from an institution? Um, It was actually John Balmain. I think, as we said, I was studying. I was at university for the time that I I also met John. and I did take that year off in the middle. And I remember John Balmain sitting me down one day when I was umming and ahhing about whether I wanted to go back to uni. And I can remember him saying to me, you need that bit of paper. Yes. You know, you're going to have to pay for your paints, your linen, um, brushes. You're going to have to have something. You have to. You can't just paint. Mm-hmm. And he was so um, on trend with his thinking. I remember him saying to me, you don't know in the next 10 years if people are going to want to buy art. Yeah. You know, we can have recessions, we can have natural disasters. Buying a piece of artwork is a luxury item. It's true. You know, and um, if people are struggling financially, they're not going to be going into galleries purchasing artwork. That's right. But I still have to buy my bread, my petrol and everything. So formulating my career with teaching and painting, um, so having classes, art prizes, uh, yeah, I had this blend that was really good for me for mm-hmm. a long, long time. And it was sort of, I wish I wish we were still back in those days, but mm-hmm. since technology's come on board and everybody's got these mobile phones in their hands all the time, everybody wants everything instant. Yes. And they don't want to take the time that it takes to learn a craft Yep. to do it well mm-hmm. um everybody wants to be to press this button and bang there's the information they wanted sure. but this process takes time to mm-hmm. acquire the skill and then it takes um those brush miles to bring the fluency out and fluency brings confidence mm-hmm. and unfortunately i feel like in australia we don't have that appreciation like we have in the states or in the uk mm-hmm. for good craftsmen ship skills yeah sure um over in in europe of course in the uk you've got galleries everywhere yeah here most people just know of the melbourne national gallery or yeah. canberra we don't have that quantity of galleries around mm-hmm. it and we don't have the history of those great masters um you know i mean we we appreciate hans heisen and albert namajira um you know we but really our repertoire is not very big mm-hmm. And from about the late 60s and 70s, of course, the traditions changed where everybody was deliberately steered away from traditional yeah, art. Yeah. And there's this big gap um, and it's a shame. I feel like I'm clinging to 
the last hurrah of what was done as an academically trained artist for sure. traditional work. Yeah. That unless I pass it on, it's just going to die out. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And I think every, any any artist that does, you know, take up this this this, this tradition um, should, if, they, if they're not already, passing it on should seriously think about, yeah. you know, teaching and passing it on in order to preserve yeah. the tradition for future uh, generations. Yeah. Entering a university program to study a Bachelor of Education in Fine Art while completing your training with John must have been an interesting contrast. What were your observations of studying in such an institution and how did it differ from what you had experienced with John? And you have put, spoken a little bit about you know, yeah. the, the difference between the abstract and the figuration. Um, what kind of philosophy were they pushing in the school? Um, it was more about trying to be unique. Yes. Than, more than anything. Yeah. It was, um, they didn't want me to do something that has already been done in the past. Mm. That was a heavy focus. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like working huge on something I didn't fully understand or appreciate. So I wanted to work smaller. And I, I kept getting told, well, go bigger, much bigger, much bigger. Yeah. Um, but my belief is we're used to seeing people, like I'm looking at you and I know the approximate size of what a head looks like and yeah. the positions of your, these features where they lie yeah. in the face. Um, to go larger than life takes us down a completely different narrative. Mm. We're almost going on to the cartoon kind of different, a different look. I'm used to seeing people in a traditional sense, so I'm yeah. going to paint them in a traditional sense. Mm -hmm. um, still life, I like the still life to never, the subjects that I choose for still life to not be bigger than they would be in real life. Sure. Because once you go bigger, you start to play with people's heads too much. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I feel like. The concept that they were, they wanted us to do more conceptual work, pull it out of our head, yeah. not have to have it set up in front of us. Why can't you just think of it out of your head? Yeah. Surely you can just draw that. You don't have to have a, a reference. Sure. Um, no, I mm -hmm. needed the reference and I wanted to set things up. I wanted to play with light. I wanted to do detail. Right. They right. weren't interested. And, yeah, we it was a battleground. Absolutely. It was a battleground and I fought. In my head, I can remember arriving at John Balmain's almost in tears, yeah. saying, I don't want to go back, I can't go back. Sure. And then he'd say, you need that bit of paper. Yeah, and, that's it. And he was right because yeah. once I finished through John, I got the position of teaching at McClellan Gallery yeah. as a qualified artist mm. with proper training. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of the teachers that were teaching mm -hmm. at the Guild didn't actually have that official qualification. Sure. I was, but because I was so young, um, I think it was thought of, well, we'll give her a try. Mm -hmm. We'll see how she goes. I was always told that I'm on trial. Yeah. And I'd go back to John and I'd say, well, how long does my trial have to last? <laughs> yeah. And he said, oh, you're, there's no trial now. You're in Fiona. <laughs> but I think it was always thought that because I wasn't old enough, I, I couldn't possibly know more than, say, if I was yeah. to teach adults in an adult class. Sure. But it it's really was about that foundation. And the, the kids' classes were my making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And what, what John Balmain wanted me to do with those kids, he guided me through those. So I'd take photos or I'd bring one of the students' works that I was so wrapped in, take it and show it to John. And I'd say, what do you think of this? And he'd say, oh, you're onto something there. Yeah. I'll hang on to that one. That one's going to be good. Sure. And, and I would get really excited for them. Yeah. And yeah. He was, he got into my head in such a strong way that I was determined I was going to do the same for this next sure. group of people. Mm -hmm. And they were bold, brave. They'd mm -hmm. do anything I put up. That's Black and white plaster cast. I even made one young boy who's a brilliant artist now. He was made to paint a landscape out, from outside the That's building. Right. I'd make him go outside, study, look at what it is he's wanting to paint, retain it in your head and go back inside to your easel and paint what you just remembered, mm. then go back out. Sure. Now, kids will take that on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of adults that would just no. <laughs> buck at that. Yeah. But no, the kid, they would do anything. I'd have them painting still off on one side of the easel, would be sorry, the setup, and the easel they were painting on was right over the other side of the mm -hmm. studio. Sure. So they just had to go back and forth, yeah. back and forth, and retaining. Yeah, and it's uh, great memory training as yeah. well, isn't it? Yeah. But like, they taught me so much too. They taught me about how brains are wired and the order of visual importance, and kids are so blunt. Yes. Yeah. You know, I say, what's the biggest difference? 
and they will nail it first time. Yeah. Whereas adults think it's got to be complicated and they want to put it into it. You know, adult terminology. Adult yeah. Whereas a child will just go, "Well, yours is too light," or, <laughs> um, "Well, you're missing that down there," and they're not even describing the. Ob- they're not saying what the object is. They just they might not know that what's a, you know a supermarket. Some of these young ones they don't know what a what a peach is or a nectarine. Yeah. Who's that? A, you know, <laughs> and they just look and they say it's a shape, a large shape of light surrounded by a mid tone or. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's um, it's interesting the language that they use to explain things gets you to think about things differently as yeah. well. Yeah, it clarifies everything. Sure. That's for sure. <laughs> Since 1990, you have given private tuition for children and adults in your own teaching studio, teaching still life, portraiture, and on plan air painting, which are all governed by the philosophy of the Max Meldrum School of Tonal Realism. How do you adapt your teaching to suit different age groups of students? Well, the age isn't really a factor in it. I teach the young ones exactly the same way that I teach adults. Okay. Um, the adults like a lot of tea and coffee. <laughs> the kids <laughs> don't. But I, I used to find the students, that, the young students that were ha- almost steered towards me or I plucked them out of somewhere because I recognised a talent when I was teaching in a school, um, they're very open-minded children and mm. they're very grounded. They're not show ponies or anything. They're usually pretty pretty grounded and level. And the parents, I can tell, are also very grounded yeah. and very, um, very good with communication. They trust. The parents have to trust me. Um, but the, the thing is the kids... If I demonstrate, they'll trust me. Mm. They're so used to being told what to do at school. Yeah. But if I, I mean, I'm hoping that my work speaks volumes and I don't have to say a lot. If mm-hmm. I do a demonstration, sometimes they'll remember the demonstration, but they don't remember anything that I've said. Yeah. So if the demonstration's good enough, the message gets through. Sure. But the student has to be in the right headspace too right so this idea of having a studio set up like this it's very important that you bring the people through the door they get into that headspace very quickly Mm -hmm. if there's too much if someone's wearing polka dots or stripes fluorescent top or something it's distracting to the person who's next to them sure everything has to be set up that leads the the artist to or the student to go down this path and get to that part of the lesson Mm -hmm. so even the uh, the lights have this guard on them so they don't have eye strain so spotlight for each easel but each spotlight has a guard that stops the glare in the eye sure um i often um have the studio dark and only the spotlight on the subject okay so my eyes aren't straining looking around and then having to readjust Mm -hmm. every time i go back um, so there's a lot of things that are physically set up that lead people to an end result mm-hmm. without them actually trying to think about it too much. Sure. Interesting. Really interesting. <laughs> you are a devotee of working from life and are inspired by casual observation and the order of visual importance which dominates your personal work as well as your philosophy on teaching. What is it about working quietly from casual observation that you find fascinating and what keeps you coming back for more? The chase. Definitely the chase, chase. yeah. Yeah. Um, This idea that what I'm trying to do is try and imagine the painting complete. So Mm. when I set up a subject, say a still life or a model for a portrait, I have to visualise is it doable in paint? Does it fit the gamut of oil paint? Sure. Some subjects are better left as a drawing right. some might be only photographed like wisteria looks fantastic in a mm. photograph to paint it it's a it's a bit more like the rubik's cube yeah. but um the subject itself um well it's always traditional it's just mm. how i like the subject sure yeah sure. I, i'd say um i've lost my train of thought then sorry <laughs> yeah got, um I try and set up subjects for people that have a lot of drama. So I'm not actually asking them to mix a lot of colour. The colour scheme is usually pretty pretty small. Yeah. Um, Children don't understand a lot about colour, as Mm. I said. If I give them black and white, 
I can work through tone with them. But if I give them a tonal exercise, but they're allowed to use a lot of colours, they get carried away with the colour. Yeah, they're seduced by the colour or right. the fine detail that in their head they want to get down. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got to I've got to make sure that I'm giving an exercise that I know they're capable of doing. Mm-hmm. And it's better to give them something that's a bit on the easier side, but expect a higher quality. Sure. Right. If you give someone something that is a little bit too hard for them, and they're not a confident person, or they they could get their confidence crushed just because that morning they got out of bed on the wrong side. Yeah. You know, it's knowing how far you can push somebody, and when somebody, if someone's getting a bit too cocky and they think, "Oh, I'm pretty good. I got a prize. It's a you know rotary show down the road." Mm-hmm. I'd pull them back down and put them on a black and white, on a plastic cast again and say, right, well, now what you've just done in that landscape, you're going to do with that on this portrait. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but as I said, the kids are great. I can throw them in any direction and they're really good. Going out landscaping, (sighs) got to make sure there's a public toilet nearby. That's right. Got to make sure there's some shade if it's Mm -hmm. warm, some cover if you've got, you know, storms coming over. I've been painting in the snow before and I had my mother holding an umbrella <laughs> over the top of me, of me whinging about my feet being so cold. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think plein air is, is a good test. It, it sorts out who can and who can't paint. Sure. Um, still life, if it's you know, not a moving target, like the flowers aren't wilting or the sh- bananas going brown or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think... Plain air and portrait painting from life really expose the weaknesses in painters. Mm -hmm, Sure. And um, how about figure drawing? Figure drawing also. Mm -hmm. My figure drawing um, took on a painterly aspect after I won the bail. I did a lot of line drawing Mm -hmm. before the bail, Mm -hmm. uh, before my winning of the scholarship. But after that, my drawing ended up becoming painting with a drawing medium. Yeah, right. And a lot of tonal painters do that. yeah, Max Meldrum, who my teacher, John Balmain, was taught by, mm. he had this saying to his students, you don't need to draw to be able to paint. Mm. But what he neglected to say was that he had spent years over in France yeah. doing academic drawing. Yeah. Um, I don't think he was correct to say that, but when I'm teaching the young children, they don't have a lot of drawing skills. I'm actually teaching them observation skills. Mm. And it's those observation skills that are the same skills that are required when you're doing life drawing. Absolutely. But the model as a moving target has a bit bigger risk attached to it than a still life on the bench that doesn't get moved or the sure. lights are stable. Mm-hmm. Um, landscape, a moving target. I call that a moving target yeah. because the clouds throw shadows which move, the sun changes angle, um, there's a lot of factors involved with, with landscaping and whether you're tough enough to you know, cope out in the rain or the wind. That's right. Whether you're in the sun and it's a th- the temperature's going up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're constantly chasing effects. Yeah. 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 In your own experiences, what personality types do you find are drawn to realist painting? Mm. Well, I'd say the perfectionist is a classic person that will walk through my door. Mm. Um, they can be the harder ones to teach sometimes because in their head they already have an idea how it's done. Yeah. Um, I like teaching beginners mm-hmm. because I can get them to go on this on this scale where they say that's really good and that's beginner. Um, beginners, when I train them, they tend to go up quite quickly Yeah. like that. Yep. Whereas people who've been to five or six different teachers over the years or more or self-taught, I find they tend to go like that. I see, right, right. Whereas the beginner I can get because they don't hold back. Mm-hmm. As I said, um, there's this idea that you can only be good once you've reached a certain age. Mm-hmm. Well, I think my theory is that, you know, the kids can be taught exactly the same mm-hmm. um, proves that wrong. I think uh, it's a bit, a bit of a shame that people don't take this up until they've retired. Yeah, yeah. And then they might need a hip replacement or knee replacement or whatever, mm-hmm. and it, it all impacts. But and their brains are filled with so much information. Sure. Whereas the children, they retain everything, and if it's presented in a in an amusing style, yeah. or if I say we're going out landscaping and and we're bringing the chocolate, the chips, and, yeah. and at the end of it we're all going to so-and-so's house for a dip in the lake, Yeah, um, they're on board. <laughs> right? And then when we're painting, 
they're really serious because we don't have much time. It's a children's class. Yeah. The adults will be there to pick them up, whereas adults just take their time. They go, oh, I'll go at this again next week. Yeah, sure. Oh, no, you won't. Subject mm-hmm. won't be there next week. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. In 1995, you were awarded the Amy Bale Scholarship, which enabled you to study classical portraiture and still life in Europe for 18 months. Did winning this award come as a shock to you? Um, I'm shocked that I was still the recipient of the prize. I did aim for the prize. Uh, I believe all the painters that enter this scholarship Mm. hope to win it, of course, but I think it took me four years to win it. And at the time, the scholarship was being granted every year. Now it's a biannual event. So there's a lot longer to um, acquire your folio. I think the scholarship... Um, was perfectly suited to my training Mm -hmm. and my teacher being very, very good friends with a lot of the past members of the 20 Melbourne Painters, he kind of knew what to do with me to get me to win that prize. Sure. And I didn't know any other way and I I certainly knew that what was going on at university was not the path I was going down. Yeah. So when my teacher introduced me to the Alice Bale, and I think he took me to one of the exhibitions, mm-hmm. um, and it was actually at McClellan Gallery, in okay. the main gallery, not mm-hmm. the workshop sure. studios. And walking around with him at that exhibition, I can remember going out and following John to his car, and I was with my parents, and I, was just, I said, I've got to go and tell him something. And I said, John, I reckon I can do this. Wow. I reckon this is, <laughs> this is an exhibition I want to be involved in. Mm-hmm. And he just said, yes, I know. <laughs> he said, it's going to take time. And he knew from then on that everything I painted, I wanted to consider how does this fit in with the 20 mil, with the requirement For of the Alice Bale, Bale Scholarship. Yeah, yeah. And it was all exactly what John had been teaching me. Mm-hmm. And I just knew, I thought, I can do this. Mm-hmm. I can do this, what's required. Sure. Can I be the best at it that I get it? Mm. No, and even to this day I'm, I still say no mm. because the award is given to encourage up yeah. and coming. Yeah. It's not necessarily aimed at those that have already been scholar- serial scholarship winners and they've been overseas and they've already studied in Florence for four years or they've been at the um, um, Slade School or whatever. Mm. It, it's. I knew when I won the prize that I was – given the prize so that I could go further. Sure. It certainly didn't make me think I was the best. I know I wasn't the best on no. that day. Yeah. But I knew I had a long way to go and I knew what I wanted to do mm-hmm. at that stage. Mm-hmm. And John Belmain had guided me down that pathway. Sure. And very deliberately. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm so grateful because everything he did to train me to do what I'm doing today, um, it wasn't necessarily done with the view of me winning the yeah, Alice Bale, yeah. but that was a, a consequence of his good teaching, mm-hmm. me being in the right headspace at that time. Um, a lot of things had to happen for mm-hmm. me to win that. I had to literally say, well, I'm not going to plan to go and have kids or change my career or whatever. I'm looking forward to just painting for the next couple of years. Yeah, How I'm going to make money from it, I don't know, but I'm going to make it happen. Mm-hmm. So teaching in primary schools, doing emergency teaching kind of yeah. paid for me to be able to go and buy my linen, my brushes and whatever I needed to move towards getting that scholarship. Sure. So. Do you think you could have or you would have won the bail if it wasn't for John? No. Wow. Absolutely not. Um <sighs> The luck, there was luck involved in that I met him and it was, it was just a strange thing that happened that it, when I was 10 years of age, my mum sent me to McClellan Gallery for lessons. Yeah. You know, it could have been my brother went off surfing and my sister went off and did tennis or ballet or whatever. But, you know, when you're young, you, your parents tend to give you a try at everything. Sure. And I, I guess that um, it's hard to to see that I was deliberately put in that art class at 10. Mm. You know, it was a set of circumstances that happened when I was, you know, halfway through my university degree that guided me towards John Balmain, yeah. the father of the man that taught me when I was 10. Sure. Um, he just made sense where 
I'm not a literary person. They, they could go and listen to a lecture at uni and I get half of it. So I, I'm a visual person. Mm-hmm. And what John did for me was tell me it was okay mm-hmm. to just be a visual person. Sure. And I lost the fear of not being able to pass at uni and do something else that was too hard. Yeah. And I started to settle on this idea that, I know John's saying it's not a great path financially to go down this direction, mm. but get that bit of paper. You can do your school teaching or whatever you need to to pay for you to do your art. Mm-hmm. And so we married together my career path between teaching, painting and um, the prize money basically. Sure. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Sounds like uh, John really gave you confidence. He gave me everything that I needed to feel safe Mm-hmm. to do this, to go down this path. Sure. Great, man. Can you provide a recollection of your time studying in Europe, including the countries you visited, the museums and key works you encountered, as well as how you went about incorporating what you were experiencing into your own work? Yes. Um, look, the prize was for 12 months in Europe. Yeah. Um, I'd say most of my time that I spent studying was really in the galleries doing mm-hmm. copy work and mm-hmm. going around looking at the exhibitions. Um, in terms of formal classes, I did pay up front for a term, as I said, at Charles Cecil's studio, but it didn't eventuate, unfortunately. But um, my study, it effect, the effect of me seeing these paintings up close, the paintings that I had seen in books previously or through high school being forced to do art history and I'm looking at Michelangelo, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I really was a bit blasé to yeah. what I had, what was coming for me. Um, the adult in me now wishes that the child in me could have foreseen how that would have been beneficial to have taken more notice back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. But um, I'd say I appreciate now as an adult what they were trying to do for me back then. Sure. Not the modern stuff, of course. And I don't remember dates or names of artists specifically mm. like a lot of other people probably would. But, um, yeah, I did a lot of copy work in London because mm-hmm. it was accessible and didn't have to the barrier of the language or the money exchange and everything. Uh, Spain, I tried to do copy work in Spain, but that was quite difficult. And in the end, I think they really only allowed Spanish students to yeah, copy. Yeah. There was a huge fee attached if you're an outsider. Um and time restraints too. I was wanting to see so much. So, and I remember phoning home to John Balmain and saying, I don't think I've got enough time. I need more time here. And what if I miss out on that over there? Yeah. I've been told I need to go and see this here. Um, and John just said, just go with your gut. You yeah. don't have to do anything like you've got there. You, you're going to enjoy that um that surprise element along the way. Sure. You know, it might be painting outside, doing some plein air, and someone drives past and says to me, no, I've got to, they want to show me something. Yeah. And they've got the most incredible view at their property. Sure. And they've just opened another door for me, so I'll stay another couple of days. Yeah. I get to know the, the culture and everything of that area. Sure. Those things are important. Mm. As someone so young and impressionable, you know, to, to not be too tunnel vision and say, I'm only here to paint. Mm. There's more to it than just painting. Yeah. It's immersing yourself in the culture and Absolutely. the activities of the people around you and sure. watching things go through changes over seasons. And, yeah, that there's so much more than just painting. Absolutely. And at this point, what was your age? Uh, I was about 20. 20, so you were so, quite sorry, young. No, sorry, no. I was 25, 26, 25. Okay, 26. so yeah. yeah, you weren't weren't very old. I mean, no, no. To me, 26. I think the twenty five year olds these days are so much more worldly because they've got the world in their fingertips. That's right. Of course. Yeah. Um, the paintings that I was going to study was Velasquez, Corro for landscape, um, Vermeer. I know John had tried to push me down the path of studying Vermeer and all the Dutch masters. But in books, yeah. when I opened it, the, the images were so condensed and tight by the time they reduced, you know, a huge big study, yeah. painting down to a tiny study like that, mm-hmm. it's not anything like the real thing. No, not at all, And yeah. I remember standing in front of um, a little Rembrandt landscape of a bridge in the Stadel Museum and 
I came out of there and I rang John Belmain up and I was in tears. I said, you've got to see this. I've just seen this incredible little Rembrandt landscape. Good, 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 he said. <laughs> and they wouldn't allow you to take photographs back then. And yeah. I wasn't even allowed to get up really close. I just sure. set off all the alarms. And, yeah, yeah. and I'd have people tap me on the shoulder and say, do you mind just stepping back? And as soon as they turned around, I'm back, <laughs> back up again. Sure. But um, that little painting really left a huge memory on me because I wasn't thinking of Rembrandt as a landscape painter. Yeah. I was thinking of, of the Night Watch and I was gobsmacked when I got to see the Night Watch. But um, there's little surprises sure. along the way of, and there's artists that I hadn't even heard of. Mm. Um, a retrospective on Winslow Homer at the London National oh, Gallery wow. when I arrived. Yeah. And I, I'm going, oh, I didn't come. Do you know about Winslow Homer, John? <laughs> John, you've got to see this. And he said, oh, well, there's plenty of that, plenty more to come. Yeah, that's incredible. So, Even though you didn't get the chance to study with Charles Cecil, did you ever meet him? Yes, yes. Oh, you did? Lovely man, highly educated, very um, a broad thinker, captivating actually mm -hmm. in, in his um, mannerisms. Mm -hmm. I can see how his students become captivated by him and yeah. follow him. He's yeah. a great teacher, um, a great painter mm -hmm. himself as well. Sure. Yeah. And the students that he put out, puts out, they're really good students. Yeah. Some of them come back and enter the Alice Bale. Mm -hmm. So um, just the idea, that I think I was the only Aussie at the time painting, but there wasn't any Italians in the school, yeah. even though I was in Florence. Wow. Uh, I can remember them from everywhere else, all over the world, but not really Italians. Mm -hmm. So That's incredible. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the quality of painters that come out of Charles' school. Yeah. Uh, you know, recently we've had the, the passing of the Queen and it yeah. was uh, once said that, uh, well, once I was speaking with a particular student that had gone to the Charles Cecil studio is now saying that, you know, it's pretty much known that every student that, well, not every student, he was exaggerating, but a majority of students that go through the, the school end up painting the Queen at some point. Oh, really? It's, it's a fine portrait school. And, Yes, yeah. um, that's a funny thing you should say that. It was only last week I was with fellow member Bill Caldwell in Mount Eliza and um, I'd gone to Mount Eliza to have breakfast with my, my mum and Charlie and next door to the cafe was an op shop and in the window was a portrait of Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. And I looked and there was no signature. It was about 16, 16 by 20 inches and I took a photograph of it through the window because it was a Sunday and they, yeah. they weren't open. I thought, oh, I'm going to have to wait. I'll just stay another night and come back and get in there at 10 o'clock. Sure. And I had said to my mother, I don't care what it costs, I'm getting that portrait. It looks so much <laughs> like a Sir William Dargy. Yeah, yeah. Well, as it turns out, it was by William Dargy. It Dargie. was, wow. Yes, so unsigned. Um, so William would do several copies of one painting. Yeah. And the one of the wattle dress, um, he did three versions of it. Mm -hmm. So one was for himself, one was to be freighted over, uh, one went by sea and by plane, I think. Yeah. And on the back he's written, this is a copy of, to ensure the safe delivery of at least one I portrait right. by, uh, by Sir William mm -hmm. of the Queen. So... As it turned out, 10 o'clock the next morning, my friend Bill and I, we landed on the doorstep waiting for them to open and who uh -huh. should open the door? Sir William's son. Oh, are you kidding me? He wow. was minding the shop that morning in Mount Eliza and <laughs> Bill and I had sp spent a few minutes outside before that opened deciding how we were going to get the price down. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. were we going to say? And with the, I'm going, it's too good a portrait. We can't say anything bad about this portrait. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but it's not signed. Okay, well, it's not signed. And, oh, it's by an amateur. <laughs> Thankfully, we got in the shop and the man introduced himself and said, well, my father painted that. Oh, wow. And I looked at him and thought about his age and I remember meeting Sir William after my scholarship, mm -hmm. um, and he was um, not around. He wasn't around much longer after that, actually. But this gentleman was able to tell us a lot about this portrait and mm -hmm. how Sir William had painted a couple of copies of it. But the night before, I'm on my phone. I'm googling images of the Queen yeah. painted by Sir William Dargy, and there it was. There it was the, the copy of that one. Yeah but with a little bit more detail, was there in my hand and I've just, you know, when you get that, that buzz and you go, 
I just worked that out. <laughs> oh, right? And I've gone on the phone and I've said, Bill, have a look at this. Yeah. You tell me that that's not by Sir William Dargie. Yeah. And of course it was. Wow. Yeah. Did you end up finding out the cost for that particular uh, Not for sale. Oh, it wasn't it for was sale. only in the window because of the Queen's passing. passing so yeah. it was there sentimentally. But, yeah. um, oh, gosh, the buzz I got. And sure, I couldn't sleep yeah, that yeah. night. All I could think of was I've got to get back for 10 o'clock. Yeah, I don't yeah. care what it costs. I'm going to buy it. <laughs> no, it didn't happen. Uh, whilst you were in Italy, did you meet any other of the teachers that are uh, running the schools there? No, I didn't. I didn't speak Italian. Mm -hmm. um, Charles, of course, being an American, was easy to converse with while he was there. But um, there was this vibe of when you're in Italy, do as Italians do. So the other yeah. students would practice teaching, talking in Italian. Yeah. And they'd been there for a couple of years. Mm. So I arrive and I go into the fourth year level and I found it a little bit hard to connect with the others okay. I, I think charles had built me up and said this guru from australia is coming in she's trained with john balmain and she's won this big scholarship mm -hmm. little did i know that he was training people to win the scholarship i see then. right right yeah. um yeah so anyway i found it hard to to hang around and i didn't drink coffee and, no. and the Italians are big on their coffee. <laughs> yeah. And smoking was in back then as yeah. well. So I just didn't – I didn't smoke and I didn't drink alcohol or coffee. So I kind of spent my time just going in and out of galleries till mm. I was so exhausted and then the evenings I'd just crash. Sure. And then get up the next day and do it all over again. Well, that sounds great. That sounds fantastic. In 2011, you had an exhibition entitled Fiona Bilbra and Brett Jarrett at the Seaview Gallery in Queenscliff. How have you found the experience of exhibiting your work with another artist? Well, I, I have no problem with exhibiting with other artists. The thing is to make the pairing work. Yeah. So um, I don't think there would be a benefit to me exhibiting my still life alongside another still life, solely still life painter. I like. I think we need a bit of a mix. Sure. Um, and there, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to be paired up with somebody, say, abstract expressionist because mm. my work would be quite small by comparison in terms of the effect on the brain. There's a lot of people that paint for shock mm. and you've got to get someone's, um, someone to look at your work within seconds that they walk into a room, a gallery sure. space. Um, I, th I hope my work speaks for itself mm -hmm. and they don't have to go and give a spiel about it. Yeah. And I would hope that people that I exhibit with are on the same wavelength as well, that the work doesn't need explanation. Mm -hmm. So um, I exhibit in rotary shows. A lot of people would know that. Mm -hmm. And the rotary shows have been a really good training ground for a lot of artists. Sure. It gives us our entry point to go in public. Mm -hmm. And it can be quite daunting for students to enter their works for the first time. But I can honestly say if I say to somebody, you're going to go in this show, I want you to put that in, they raise the bar. Yeah. As soon as you know a work has got to be framed, the next one had better be as good as it. Mm. Don't part with anything that you think was good until you've been able to beat it. Sure. So this idea of exhibiting publicly with somebody else or um, even doing solo exhibition it's good. It's good to be out there and looking at your work in relation to other stuff that's sure. around it. You got to get out the studio at times. Yeah. It really helps you get perspective yeah. on your work. But, but to be inspired by other people. Absolutely. I mean, I'm inspired by other people all the time. Sure. And it's going to, um, say, Camberwell Rotary, which is was was the biggest show in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and before I was one of the twenty Melbourne, I made it. Uh, it you know, it was mandatory that I would go and see Camberwell every year and the 20 Melbourne Painters annual exhibition. Sure. That, they were the most important things I had to do in mm -hmm. the year and, and I would never forego that. Sure. So, I mean, both of those shows have a huge variety of artists in them, mm -hmm. uh, particularly Camberwell. And Camberwell I would often walk past a lot and mm -hmm. only stop on occasion and then I'd stand in front of a piece and look at it for quite a while before I'd move on. Right. But um, I don't look at everything. I don't like everything. I just quite often pass stuff. And then sometimes I'll be surprised and I'll stop at something that will grab me and I'll go, I don't know what I like about it, but I like it. Mm -hmm. um, you're allowed to just like it for sure, no reason. for no reason, so, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. I understand you have entered your paintings into the Archibald Prize on numerous occasions. 
However, 2014 was a particularly interesting entry for you. Due to undergoing surgery in the same year, you were unable to use your right hand to paint with. Your painting entitled Fear, Hope, Trust features yourself under anaesthetic while undergoing the surgery. You had a photographer take photographs of you when you were in the operating room, is that correct? Yes, it is, yes. Um, well, I'm right-handed. I had an ulnar shortening in my right arm, my sure. right wrist, and it did stop me from painting for a while, but mm -hmm. it had to be done. I wasn't painting fluently anymore. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of arthritis there. So it was a bit of a, a gimmick, I suppose, I put it in the Archibald, but it ended up, it was probably more a genre painting. So um, it didn't end up making the finalist. But the purpose of that painting was my, um, uh, as a shock value painting. Yeah. And it was sort of a self portrait. But my surgeon, I have the most brilliant surgeon in Greg Hoy, and he features in the painting as mm -hmm. well. He's holding my arm up. Um, and it's called Fear, Trust, Hope because. I, at that point, I think I'd given up thinking that before that that I was going to be able to paint fluently again. Mm -hmm. And he had said to me that you'll get most of the movement back mm -hmm. and he said, and nothing will be painful anymore. So I just threw my hands in the air and said, yeah, I'll just do it, I have to do it. Sure. Well, I've got nothing else to lose. Sure. So trying to paint with my left hand while in recovery was really hard. Mm. I'm a bit like a bull at a gate. When I want to do something well, I make sure I set myself up to do it well. Mm -hmm. So trying to paint left-handed, it was such a poor compromise. Mm -hmm. And I didn't last very long, but I did paint a lot of the bigger areas in that painting with my left hand. Mm -hmm. By the time I've got down to the, uh, you know, eliminating the biggest differences and I'm getting more refined, my right arm had started to, I, you know, with support, I could start painting with it. Okay. So it was a combination of both, but majority, I'd say 85% with my left hand. Okay. So, wow. And, and I wow. had this um, thing in my head that I was going to make sure that I could show the surgeon that I was worthy of the surgery, <laughs> that I'm going to paint and it's got to be a good one. Sure. And, yeah, he, he's worth his weight in gold, that man. He's brilliant, <laughs> absolute genius. Great. But didn't get into the Archibald, so. No, no. Now, what inspired you to paint a subject which depicts a time in your life that many people would perhaps prefer to forget? <laughs> well, I think it's rather fun painting blood and guts and gore okay. and seeing the reaction on people's faces. Sure. And my belief is I want to be able to do like a small still life of Dutch master mm. into blood and guts and gore. Okay. But usually when I have a surgery, I ask for photography. Oh, you do? As, yeah, I always okay. do. And wow. fortunately, Greg Hoy does my upper body. So he's always very obliging and he's always taking photos for me. Um, I just find it amusing to try and paint this illusion again, squirting liquid stuff out of a tube. Yeah putting it on a 2D surface and trying to make somebody think that's blood. Mm -hmm. And to see somebody looking at my painting and go, oh, I can't look at that. Yeah. I think, oh, it's just paint on a flat surface. Right, right. You know, it's messing with people's heads. Sure. Um, it's real manipulation. I think, too, I, I, I like this idea that that's a part of my life that affected me, mm. but I've been resilient enough to come to grips with and move on. Sure. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But yeah. but I've got this I've got this idea in my head for an Archibald entry. <laughs> it's going to be nine squares. Mm -hmm. Eight of them are my, my surgeries in detail. Okay. And the middle one, my face. Okay, I see. The more the more um, blood and guts and gore, the better. <laughs> I, I feel like it's probably too traditional. The style will be too traditional to be accepted. Yeah. But the, the concept itself is Strong. would would connect yeah. maybe. Yeah, Sorry. it's such a contrast yeah. as to what, what I'm used to seeing yeah. from your work. Well, it's not Meldrum's school no, of painting no, no, either. No. It's uh, it's a gimmick, yeah. I suppose. Sure. Um, yeah, I would just do it for the sake of doing it. But my that idea of messing with people's heads really appeals to me. <laughs> How did you find the process of painting the portrait? As I understand, majority of it was completed using your left hand yeah. while occasionally using your right hand for finishing touches. Now, you've already... Yeah. Explain some some about that. Would you like to elaborate or add anything else? Um, no, I don't think I can actually. It's, sure. Yeah, it was it was a lengthy process. Mm -hmm. I can remember 
um, the starting point of it, I actually, I even asked my mum if she could help me stain the canvas yeah. originally. And we had the canvas on the floor. It's quite a large painting. And I said, mum, if you can just, I'll mix the paint up. If you can just whack it on anyway, make yeah. sure it's not too thick. And then we lifted it up onto the easel and then I was able to to slowly bring my, you know, arms up and try and sure. work out what had to go where. Mm -hmm. Um the fluent, there was no fluency whatsoever. Yeah. It was it was shocking. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even have the strength in my left arm because I was right-handed. Yeah. So this arm got fatigued quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and you think, you know, you start to, you think after a period of months you get better. Mm -hmm. I think I got more and more frustrated. Yeah. I wasn't meeting my mark. Yeah, sure. My expectation was too high. The requirement, what I was trying to do, it was such an important piece. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I just didn't reach it. And and I think today of that portrait, it, the concept is very interesting, but, um, and, yeah, it's it's a different style of work to Absolutely. what I enter into the 20 Melbourne Painters. But sure. great experience and I do it again. I mean, every time I have a surgery, I always ask for photos and, <laughs> yeah. Well, it shows your determination, uh, yeah. you know, if you can't use your right hand, you're right-handed yeah. to try and uh, paint with your, your left yeah, the hand. the balance isn't the same either. Yeah. So you've got lack of strength. Yeah. Even though this one might be in a sling, the, yeah. when you're in a sling, the balance is so different. And mm. I, even when I've had foot surgery, people say, well, you can sit down and draw or paint. Mm. Mm. Well, actually sitting with your foot up yeah. like that, your yeah. body's at you know right angle, yeah. that's not ergonomical and it's not the position I work in. Sure. So you lose that fluency. And being able to m move and rest and shift your weight, your balance, even the balance of a paintbrush varies whether you start at the hair end or if you're at the other end. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you've got to be ergonomically positioned. Mm -hmm. And in a arm in a sling, yes. trying to work that left side, the whole right side, yeah. everywhere else gets under stress. Mm -hmm. So It's interesting, isn't it, how it works, the yep. body? Yeah. Yep. You went to great lengths in setting up your model, Emma, to compose your painting entitled Aquarius, which was painted in 2016. Emma's beauty captivated you from the first time she stepped into your studio for art tuition. Can you explain the process of working with Emma to create this painting? All right. Well, Emma presented herself for lessons at my studio in Rosebud, and the moment I saw her, she reminded me of the Lady of Shalott mm. by Sir William Waterhouse. Mm. Um, so I had it in my head that I needed her hair out, red hair. Um, she had the most beautiful porcelain skin and mm. so youthful. It wasn't just about her amazing hair. Her face was so petite and it was just like in the Waterhouse portraits. Mm. So um, I invited Emma to model for me and it involved her boyfriend at the time holding on to a car battery okay. attached to a spotlight, the same spotlight that I'd be using in a studio, mm -hmm. and her mother with all her clothes and warm towels to wrap around her. Mm. We went down to the beach and in the water we go waiting for the tide to, sure. to come up. Unfortunately, it came up a bit faster than <laughs> than I had hoped and it took us quite a while to get the photographs that we wanted. Um, so that painting was a product of the photographs that we took on that night, um, Most of, or mostly the dress and the water reflections and a few of the rocks. But the actual face, I had d painted Emma quite a few times in the studio, so I had her position in that angle that the... She's in the Aquarius portrait and the lighting in the back was identical in terms of the same spotlight used, same yeah. temperature, the same globe um, and the same angle. Mm -hmm. So I was able to get an idea of colours from in the studio that I would work from life and interpret those into the photograph. Oh, I see. So it's a, a right. real mix because photography can be a big trap, mm -hmm. particularly if you're relying on um, – the colours in the photographs to be the right tone. They're never the right tone. Mm -hmm. You get strong darks. Everything that's in a nearly dark, say a dark brown or dark blue, becomes out black. Mm -hmm. And things that are very light can be wiped out completely yeah. and become yeah. white. Mm -hmm. So the camera is always inferior to what our eyes see. Absolutely. Well, well until your eyes deteriorate, that is. Mm -hmm. But the, the lens 
um, today's cameras, they're all designed to make the image you're photographing look really crystal clear. Yeah. But our eyes don't see no. that. Yeah. So if I focus on you, I can see you really clearly and I can see an assortment of noisy stuff over there, but I can't tell you what it is. Right. So my eye, my focal point, area, focal area is only, you know, so limited. Sure. But um, people who work from photographs, they tend to make the darks too dark, the lights too light. Mm -hmm. They can't manage to get the colour temperatures right for the middle tone. Sure. Um, these are traps that working from photographs, if you work from life, mostly you can do a few pieces of photog photographic reproduction work in between. Sure. And there's merit in doing both. I think when you don't have a moving target like a photograph, you've got time then to flirt with brush stroke or thin and thick paint that you mm. might not when you're in working from life. Sure. Um, clearly the scene that I set Emma up in was not something that I could do from life because no. the tide was coming in and, um, and the temperature. There's a whole lot of reasons. But we tried to set up what would be a studio lighting mm. down on the beach with Emma in the in her gown and the um, boyfriend holding the light mm -hmm. for us. Sure, lovely. Yeah. We yeah. enjoyed the experience anyway. It was fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Another powerful portrait you submitted to the Archibald Prize was in 2016 with your portrait entitled Why Rosie Batty, which depicts 2015 Australian of the Year and anti-domestic violence campaigner Rosie Batty, who I understand you formed a connection with through painting her portrait. Why did you decide to paint the portrait of Rosie and what was it that drew you closer to her? Well, I, I'm not known as being a political painter. Mm. Right? I paint what I see and I claim to be a traditional painter. Um, I had a couple of difficult years in terms of um, family, personal life, and I met Rosie at a forum on domestic violence okay. and she was a keynote speaker. And during that evening I was introduced to her and we connected straight away. Everything that came out of Rosie's mouth I could relate to and I thought, well, I don't know where to go to for help. Mm -hmm. So Rosie directed me across to Ken Lay, mm -hmm. lovely ex-police ex commissioner. Sure. Gorgeous man. And he's also from Corumbara. Oh, is he? Yeah, wow. grew up in Corumbara, went to the primary school here. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, anyhow, so I approached Rosie's uh, manager and asked if she would sit for the portrait. Little did I know that umpteen other people had all targeted yeah. her for the Archibald. Mm. Um, and I would have been happy if I uh, expected her to say no, but she I don't know whether somebody did some research on me and she was able to say yes and she arrived at my studio. We had a couple of sessions, um, spoke to her quite at length about what it was I was trying to, to do with the portrait and I wanted it to be a portrait that was still being loyal to my training. Mm. I didn't want to go way out, make it an abstract version of, of her. I wanted it to be real because what happened to her was so shocking. It's like nobody else has walked her path. Mm. So we can't begin to imagine what it's like. And for her to give me that time, she deserved to be painted really well yeah. in a manner that explained her, her headspace that I, well, what I thought her headspace could be like. So um, very difficult to do but so worthy. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd seen other portraits of her that I thought were not really, that were completely different to how I wanted to explain sure. the way I saw her. Yeah. Um, and it was really cathartic for me to be, to have Rosie in my studio and me painting. So that was kind of almost therapeutic because I wanted to keep painting but Sometimes you can get events happen in your life that it's so overwhelming that you don't think you can paint. You can't hand mm. yourself over. Mm. But this was one way of me being able to continue to paint, even though my head was stressed from other situations. Just doing Rosie's portrait and having her there was that was a powerful incentive to make sure it worked and for me to keep the consistency of keeping those brush miles sure, going. Sure. So there was a, that connection from quite a few different angles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's 
so sad what happened to to Rosie, but what a, an amazing woman. Absolutely. What an incredible role model she's become for, you know, advocating for yeah. people with such huge crises that happened to them. Sure. Um, There's such a strong woman, yeah. Yeah, yeah. beautiful lady. Absolutely. Yeah. Between September and November of 2016, you, along with fellow Mornington Peninsula-based painter Vicky Sullivan, held an exhibition together at the Mornington Peninsula Regional Gallery, which was entitled Portraits, Sullivan and Bilbra. Now, Vicky is a former student of yours. Can you explain how this exhibition came to be realised? Well, I have to give full credit to Vicky for this. Mm. Vicky's a real goer. Um, I'm probably somebody who likes to sort of hang around the back a little bit more and let my work speak for itself. But Vic Vicky, she's so good at organising things. She's a, a goer, mm -hmm. a doer. Sure. So I give full credit to Vicky and um, she's good friends with a lot of uh, painters from all over the world. She has very good IT skills that I don't have. Um, <laughs> I wish I did have. So, yeah, it was purely through Vicky that we got this up and going. And um, amazingly, we're both, well, because we're both from the peninsula, our work fitted into the Mornington Regional Gallery's calendar slot. Sure. Um, it's pretty hard to get traditional work into a regional gallery these days, okay. particularly if you're still living. Um <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, living artists don't generally get regional gallery spots, but yeah, good well, on Vicky. She's she's so good at that. Well, it's great yeah. that you were able to, to get yeah. in, and and uh, considering well, if she was a, a former student of yours as well. Yeah, and I wouldn't like to exhibit with somebody I didn't feel was up to scratch either. So I have Vicky in very high regard. That's great. And I think it was lovely that we got to paint together and and exhibit that exhibit time. Together, yeah, yeah, it was pretty special. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, some of the works that were featured in that particular exhibition that you had with Vicky included the very portrait that you painted of Rosie Batty, uh, as well as your painting entitled Fear, Trust and Hope. Can you explain the story behind the painting of Rosie? Well, as I said, um, Rosie was quite an icon at the time for the most horrible reasons, and she said that it was bittersweet, her winning the award, mm. the Australian of the Year. Um, uh, more important that, than that award to Rosie would be losing her son, of course, and under the circumstances in which it happened. Um, myself, I feel like in order to make a mark, you've got to be present and be, you know, be seen in the galleries. You can't just paint at home and not exhibit. Mm -hmm. So Rosie's portrait was my connection to the public, of course, um, but also that introverted state you get into when you're sitting and you're concentrating trying to do something to cross that border from the psych to the physicality of putting stroke to canvas mm. you know that's it's quite a, a magical state to be in it it's kind of um it feels surreal like i said we, you can't explain how messing with people's heads to, to make them think they're seeing something. Rosie's face is quite recognisable. Mm. So, A, there was an expectation of what I what I had to paint, how it had to look and the level of expertise that had to happen. Sure. Um, but for me personally, working with Rosie doing that, that was just such a therapeutic time as well mm -hmm. because to be able to continue to paint when you're under um, some form of crisis, it's quite tricky. Right. But as I said before, the, the connection with Rosie, and Rosie said the same. She said it was quite therapeutic for her to come and sit in the studio mm. with me um, and she could just sit and not speak mm. and, you know, to not feel like she's on show right? I mean, with a camera in front of her and just to sit and finally not have to think, just try to relax. Um, yeah, she didn't know what I was going to do with it, mm -hmm. but I had mirrors set up so she could watch the portrait happening and, yeah, she she said she enjoyed sitting. That's great. But, um, yeah, sometimes the models um, can work really well and other times they don't. Rosie mm. was very still. Some models, if you get children, they're always fidgeting. Yeah. You know, and they yeah. want to see it. They want to sneak a look yeah. and ask you, how much longer? Can we have a break? Yeah. And other people might, you know, elderly people might just fall asleep in the <laughs> middle of the sitting. Yeah. So, I mean, the best model is always self. Yeah. Because I know how long I've got to work. I know sure. what stage I'm going to get to before I have to stop and put the brushes down. Sure. But, no, Rosie was a beautiful model and 
um, I'd like to do her again, but yeah, who knows? Was that portrait painted in this particular studio? Or no, in that was in Rosebud. Rosebud. In Rosebud. Rosebud. Okay, yeah. all right, sure. Yeah. In 2016, you were a featured artist in the exhibition entitled Woman Painting Woman at the Beringer Cultural Centre along with Vicky Sullivan, Jackie Granford, Raylene Sharp, Sally Ryan, Avril Thomas and Heather Alice. I understand the exhibition was curated by J.D. Mittman and inspired by the Woman Painting Woman exhibitions that were begun in the United States by artists Sadie Valerie, Alia Erbermani and Diane Fiesel, which celebrates female painters and sculptors continuing in the tradition of realist art. What made you and your colleagues want to begin these exhibitions here in Australia? Well, again, I have to give credit to Vicky. She's the brainchild of this, and again, she's pulled it off in a stellar way. Um, women painters, tip, well, at the moment, we seem to have a lot of women painters. Mm. It's more female-dominated, the painting scene. Sure. But historically, it was mostly men. Mm. And around the, um, the times when Max Meldrum was teaching, it was majority men. Women were supposed to be in the kitchen cooking, preparing, looking after the kids. Mm -hmm. So... To be able to do this, to dedicate your life to this and still have a family, have other commitments, have another career that brings in more money, um, it's a juggling act yeah. all the time. And it's often a fine line in, in your consciousness to say, I'm going to hand this amount of time over today to paint because, mm. A, I should be earning other money. I should be um, doing picture framing or I've got a class to go to, um, I'm recovering from surgery I have to. It's a balancing act. Sure. And I think a lot of in in the past, a lot of male artists have been supported by their wives. Yeah. There's an old saying that every female artist needs to have a wife. <laughs> we need somebody to. I'd love to have somebody, an apprentice, say, to train to mix my paints for me, to yeah. wash my brushes yeah. at the end of the session, help me stand up and pin up a a cloth somewhere or sit in the chair and model for me, please. I just need to do some study. Mm. Um, you know, everybody would like to, to have that. But, you know, typically women haven't had that opportunity. Uh, and if we did, it, it was it's a really hobby and not serious. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I don't know, things are changing now and we definitely have a lot more females attending studios for classes. Mm -hmm. um, the dynamic hasn't really changed for as long as I've been teaching, but um, I don't know. I guess now it's seen as something that's not physically demanding to mm. do. But mm -hmm. uh, with my own work, I, if I'm on a large painting, there's a few kilometres that I walk between yeah. the canvas and where my observation point mm -hmm. is. It's not physically, you know, it's not strength requiring or anything, but I think that's why a lot of women do gravitate to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we get a lot of people, as I said earlier, when they retire, they might take up painting. Yeah. And it's because they, they often say, well, when I was younger, I used to love going to art. Mm. Um, or my grandmother was a was an artist, sure. so I thought I might see if I've inherited the gene or something like sure. that. But right. generally it's, yeah, people over, well, I'm 55, so maybe, you know, over 65 is where most of the pe people come from for me. Sure, right. And, again, they're babysitting grandkids or they're, you know, got other commitments that they've sort of juggling and still splitting mm -hmm. time between. Sure. So. Now, with those woman painting, woman exhibitions, are you having those with Vicky and your colleagues annually? No, we, we go, we're going to – well, we aim to have just the one exhibition with J.D. Mittman managing it okay. up at Beringia sure. in Upway, and it was very, very successful, and then we, we hit COVID. Okay. So COVID kind of changed everything from the classes – that we were attending or running to exhibitions, galleries closed. Some of them didn't reopen again. Um, we've got fewer galleries now than I can ever remember. Sure. Um, but anyway, um, Vicky and JD are still planning to have another exhibition and hopefully it might become a biannual event. Okay. Um, right. And Beringe has gone through some big changes recently and they've renovated, so there's quite a lot of new programs they've introduced mm -hmm. and I think every second year is probably about right because mm -hmm. it's as women painting women I mean a lot of my portraits they're very you know don't have to always just paint women so I want the paintings to be significant yeah and we have more 
women artists now in this group. So we probably don't need the five or six paintings that Vicky and I had to put in in that very first exhibition. Okay. It might be that we all put in two paintings. Okay. And because the title Women Painting Women, they have to be female, of course. But, um, yeah, it's it's really about looking at I, – I paint for the 20 Melbourne Annual Exhibition, yeah. a few rotary shows throughout the year, and – they're women painting women. I've always got that in the back of my mind. If I have a subject coming, mm. I think, oh, this could be could work. Sure. They don't have to be big paintings either. Right. They can be small. And quite often, if I'm not well and I've you know had a surgery, I'm resorting to smaller works anyway, sure. which has been the case for the last few years. My mm. my works have got smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. but hopefully more more um, intense and more refined. Right, right. Yeah. Now, with the uh, stable of artists that are usually participating in the woman painting, woman exhibitions, are you open to having more artists or is it pretty much set at the aforementioned artists? Um, I think it's going to be determined by the size of the gallery and what JD's happy as the director of the gallery. Okay. Yeah, there's only so many you can put in before it starts to look too... Um, chaotic yeah and each painting needs its own space around it for it to hold its value of course and i think the integrity of the group also must be maintained sure sure yeah. it is definitely great to see female realist artists gaining recognition in a tradition which was dominated by men throughout the centuries what is your opinion of the proliferation of female realists working in australia today i think it's on the improve and I, but I don't think it's um, been managed that way. It's just through um, COVID, people mm -hmm. have spent more time at home, people have had an opportunity to study more sure. within their home. Um, yeah, again, I'd have to say, though, the women painters that you're referring to are typically women who've maybe been married, had kids, the kids have grown up and now they're coming back to study. Yeah. Um, we'd like to see younger ones come on board more, but unfortunately, you know, the computers are just taking over. Right. Everybody's on their phone. They're all tracing images and then filling in the gaps. Well, yeah. that's not how we work. No. Um, but everything's being generated to happen quicker and easier with less physical involvement. Sure. And it's a real shame. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, I hope it doesn't die out, but the idea of the, the introduction of technology and photography into work mm -hmm. has denied a lot of artists the foundation skills of, you know, observing from life. Absolutely. You know, and it's women as well. Right. So, sure. It's yeah. uh, We've all got a responsibility to try and maintain these standards. Absolutely. Into yep. moving forward in the future. Absolutely. Yep. Now, also in 2016, you were admitted as a member to the 20 Melbourne Painter Society. For those who are unaware, the Melbourne 20 have a history that goes back to 1918 when Max Meldrum failed to be elected president of the Victorian Art Society. Consequently, Meldrum's students left the Victorian Art Society and relocated to Meldrum's studio in Hardway Chambers, Elizabeth Street in Melbourne, where they entitled themselves the Society of 20 Melbourne Painters which came to be changed to the 20 Melbourne Painter Society in 1919 when they had their first exhibition. Are you able to explain more about this election and why Meldrum and his followers felt it necessary to leave the Victorian Artists Society after not being appointed presidency? Mm. All down to egos, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, there's been lots of different types of schools available to, for students, but... Um, Max Meldrum had a group following yeah. and they wouldn't stray to anybody else. They were It was absolutely Max's way or no, it doesn't work. Um, Max's philosophy was if it's not right, it's not, it's not in the ballpark. It's got to be right or it's wrong. It can't be half right. So there was, he was very, very strict on the method. He had a philosophy that everything could be painted with five piles of paint mm -hmm. and then the rest was just calligraphy, pulling it together. I still abide by that myself and when I'm teaching I would always say to students don't make too many colors because you, you you've got to get a light and a dark for hair a light a mid and a dark for the face a light and a dark for the clothing and then there's a background so you've got like seven eight tones you've got to get spot on first mm -hmm. you can't get those right why go to a, a 13th a 15th a 20th pile of paint that doesn't it's not going to help mm -hmm. so Meldrum's um, philosophy he was so strict 
that if you couldn't handle his personality, you would go, you'd find somewhere else to go. But yeah. those that really believed his philosophy, they replicated themselves on, on his painting, on the way he mm. functioned. Um, yeah, it was quite a dramatic a dramatic turn of events, I guess, because he really divided people mm. and he wasn't a great um, communicator with women. Mm. He tended to believe that women should be at home not right. out working with their brushes. Sure. So there wasn't many female painters highly rec- highly considered by him at the time. Mm. Um, Alma Figueroa, Clarice Beckett, you know, there's just a couple that we today we can recall, but back then um, there wasn't a lot. Jane Sutherland, of course, and Alice Bale are in there. But um, typically it, it's been a hard slog for women to be taken seriously in a in the traditional painting world anyway Mm -hmm. but i do think that meldrum's he he must have separated people from wanting to paint just because his personality was so so strong and dominating sure so if you couldn't handle his character you 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 obviously weren't that interested or Mm -hmm. go somewhere else and yeah so he did have he was splitting Everywhere. Sure. Was there conflict between the Victorian Art Society and Max um, Meldrum and his group of followers? There, there was there was an altercation at the Vix one day. Um, I believe that Max Meldrum had an opinion about a certain piece that he felt wasn't up to scratch to be exhibited and he took the painting off the wall and the painting was then returned back and he said, well, you can get stuffed. I'm going, I'm going to start my own up. Wow. So it was all over what he considered was good enough. Sure, yeah. sure. That's and the exa- and the gal- um the studio space hardware chambers actually I I walked up and into that building a couple of years ago just to see where it was that he painted and it's a clothing shop now. But I looked at it. And I was trying to imagine where was the wood heater that they all used to stand around and drink and yeah. have their cigarettes and whatever. It was a pretty. Um, boisterous environment I imagine in that mm-hmm. studio there was an upstairs as well but you could still see where the staircase was and yeah up the top hardware chambers and I felt like oh I was born around that time <laughs> I'd love to have been experiencing all of that would have been something yeah sure the philosophy of the Melbourne 20 is summed up quite lovely in this following statement from the group's founding secretary Alice Marianne Allen Bale, otherwise known as A.M.E. Bale, quote, We desire nothing but sincerity and a humble study of nature, from which alone all art, whether decorative or realistic, draws any enduring life, unquote. In your own words, how would you describe the Melbourne Twenties' vision on painting? Well, I would hope that we're not that ego-driven. We're actually painting for the craftsmanship we want to perfect what we what we do and we all aspire to something that we're not at yet otherwise i suppose we just give up but it's we all the same opinion it's that journey it's the lifestyle that goes with being a painter having that opportunity to study nature and be mindfully present um i i always say that painting is uh, the, the best mindfulness you can get. Mm. You have to think ahead. Every stroke should be considered. Um, a lot of pre-planning goes into place, even for going out plein air. You know, you're trying to look at the time of the day. Where's the tide going to be? What are the clouds doing? What's the season? Which one? Was it a morning subject? Was it an afternoon subject? Um, this is making us present. And, you know, all of the 20 Melbourne, we all work from life. Some work from life and photos. Um, nobody works from photo just from photos. Mm-hmm. It, you have to have had that training, that foundation of visual observation. Sure. So the 20 Melbourne, we are all a good group that connects with each other through our art. We all understand that we get it that they're trained, they're highly trained people. Mm-hmm. No one's there by gift mm-hmm. or by luck. Uh, you have to be voted in by three quarters of the group. Mm-hmm. And it's such a privilege to be in there. It sure. really is. You know, we're, we're talking about a, a society that's, um, you know, it's over 100 years old. It's the oldest art society in Australia. And 
to be in it. You don't, you can't get in until there's a space. Mm -hmm. If someone dies, there's a space open up, space. and then you have to be voted in. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it, it is a real privilege, and hopefully for the next hundred years we'll we'll survive and keep going. But COVID certainly did test us. It was the first time that we haven't had it on the wall exhibition in all mm. the hundred years. Um, and two years in a row, we, we got the exhibition can, canned yeah. days before we opened. Sure. So um, fairly devastating. But we've had a good, good year this year. Mm -hmm. And I think the morale in the group is really good. It's always pretty good. But I think particularly this year, having been in lockdown for two years. That's great. So, and, we, yeah, sales were good. The feedback was good. Um, yeah, we, we've fantastic. enjoyed it. Okay. Now, in, in, in saying that, that the, the, uh, that the Melbourne 20 is only by invite, when you were um, invited to join, how did you feel? Oh, wow. At first I thought it was a bit of a joke. <laughs> I, I thought quietly to myself without saying anything to John Balmain, I'd love to one day be one of the 20 Melbourne. Mm. And you think, oh, gosh, how many painters are there in Australia? It's just a pipe dream. Mm. And then I thought, oh, well, I'm just... It's just there in the background. Maybe one day I will be good enough. Maybe one day, you know, I'll reach that pinnacle and think I'll be able to speak on the same level with these people. Sure. So um, I still feel like I'm a ring in a bit. I'm mm -hmm. one of the younger members, one of the newer members, but um, I hold everybody in such high regard. They're all amazing painters and craftsmen themselves, women and men. Um, really lovely people. We have robust discussion about what should be hung and what shouldn't and how we judge mm -hmm. when we do a judging. Um, they're all healthy, robust discussion, mm -hmm. discussion that's needed. Sure. Um, I wouldn't say that it's ter it's not really ego-driven and that's why I love being in the group. Uh, I think a lot of artists can get very big-headed. Yeah. And the, the painters that are in the 20 Melbourne are very humble people. Mm -hmm. yeah, we don't want to have to have it to have an explanation for people to get our work. Mm -hmm. The work should sell itself. It should speak for itself. Sure. And most of us tend to want to be in the background. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it's a, a beautiful group, a, a very tight knit group in terms of what we stand for, mm -hmm. and we follow through with that always. Sure. In the philosophy of the group, how we train people, what we expect of other members and how we, as a group, are going to relate to the general public. So you only need one person to ruin a group. Yeah. So that's why we have to be so careful who gets into the group. They have to be very, very humble, um, versatile and sensitive. Yeah, there's a whole lot. And, and just be good at communicating what we do. That's fantastic. That's great, Fiona. Fantastic. That's really... Uh, inspiring to hear that <laughs> that is such a um uh selected you know pick hand-picked almost mm. um society yeah. um and that one can only really enter if one of the members were to, were yeah. to pass yeah, yeah beautiful what is the melbourne 20 doing to ensure the preservation of knowledge of Meldrum school of tonal realism well this is where the alice bale scholarship comes in mm. so um we manage the judging and the awards of the Alice Bale Scholarship, which, as some may or may not be aware, the scholarship is for a travel period. Um, it's $50,000 to travel overseas and study art, whether it be in a training academy or through the galleries. It's not specified exactly how you should spend it. Um, sometimes the spontaneity of just existing in a foreign village is an experience enough in mm -hmm. itself. Um, but... The scholarship is aimed at up and coming and people that we think might be good um, ambassadors for us as Australians. We, we know there's a lot of people from Europe and the UK, America that come here and they're painting already, but we want to train people up and say we've got some Aussies that can do the, the Florence Academy kind of training. Um, We've got schools around Australia, particularly in Sydney, there's uh, the Julian Ashton School, which has been quite renowned for um, training up really good painters, particularly in portrait work. But I think uh, from the 20 Melbourne's perspective, we'd hope that it's not just the, that one academy that's going to be able to produce painters. Mm. We're trying to 
teach other students that they can also enter and have a go at this. Mm. Um, my idea is I, I love working with the young ones, but the age group that we're, we're not really, we're not ageist, but we, the scholarship demands that you be able to have a driver's licence, you can get yourself around, um, so obviously over 18, but somebody that's going to continue to pass on the message of the training mm. and that, um, you know, the skills that we do. And obviously the person that we choose has to, we, we need to know they're going to come back yeah. and they're not going to go overseas, <laughs> find someone to marry and we don't get them back because that won't pass the knowledge on. But like the 20 Melbourne members, the winner we hope will come back and continue that career path. Mm -hmm. So we have to choose really carefully that we know these peop the people we're looking at and considering are not doing this on a whim and it's not sure. just a passing phase. Right. So we need to see their work building up over a couple of years beforehand and see that they're still following that path and mm. they're sticking, they're very dedicated. Mm -hmm. um, Open-minded, that they're prepared to just be flexible and, um, you know, I mean, COVID hit, so our recent recipients had to spend time only in Australia and he's split the scholarship up into two halves. Mm. One was the first half was establishing his own studio and teaching and the second half is now going to be travelling all overseas. Sure. But um, that ability to travel is so important for an Australian painter, you know, to see what we've got over there. I mean, it's we, you're sure we can look at our phone and Google, you know, Sergeant at, you know, some gallery in, in America, but to go and stand in front of a painting, it can make you weep. You just, you go, oh, how did they do that? And you see the thin and thick paint. You mm. see um, a, a canvas, whether it's coarse or smooth or if it's on the diagonal weave. You know, these things you can't pick mm -hmm. just by looking at a, a reduced um, postage stamp size image. No, yeah. So these young ones need to be exposed to that. Mm -hmm. it, it's not okay to be insulated and just stay in Australia because you've only really got the national galleries to mm -hmm. go to or the, some of our regional galleries. Country regional galleries are really good too. Sure. Particularly their permanent collections. But um, that experience of going overseas is so important. You mm -hmm. know, it, it, it's life-changing to get on a plane go overseas and say, right, I don't have to worry about the house falling down or yeah. um, minding the next door neighbor's dogs or whatever. It's just I'm there to paint and observe and learn and study so that you can suck it up. You know, it, you're a sponge over there. You're not meant to be going off having dinner with people or going to nightclubs and whatever. You're there to study. And the dedicated recipient gets that. Absolutely. They know it and yeah. they knew it before they even entered. So, yeah, hopefully the Alice Bale is preparing our next generation of hopefully even 20 Melbourne painters. Mm -hmm. You know, these winners may become 20 Melbourne painters in the future. Sure, sure. But we have to hang on to this craft. It's We can't let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's too valuable and it's a pity that it's not more appreciated here in Australia. But sure. this is where we just start with the, the young ones and hopefully they stick at it. I agree. Yeah. So just to clarify, uh, Fiona, with the Alice Bell Scholarship, so it's actually governed by perpetual trustees. They look after the financial side. They look after the financial yes, side. Yes, but okay. the 20 Melbourne judge it and yep. we judge it on the, um, the basis that, uh, oh, sorry, on the understanding that the recipient will follow in the footsteps of Alice Bale herself. Okay. So she went overseas to study. Yeah. Um, <laughs> pardon me, came back. Um, so the idea, the intention is that you follow that path of training, sure. the academic training yeah. and observations of what she would have been seeing when she was on sure. her travels overseas. So, so the perpetual trustees, is that part of Miss Bale's estate? Well, what happened, Miss um, Bale had a house in Kew that was made available as a, it was a pri the prize was yeah. actually to stay rent free That's in right. her house and studio. Yeah. But over time, the studio became, or the house became so dilapidated that it was, then it became only land value. Okay. So the property was sold and the funding went to this travelling scholarship. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there was a few, probably three or four winners before me that were 
the recipients when it became just the, the grant to go and study sure, overseas. Sure, sure. But um, originally you'd, you'd follow the footpaths of, of the, the path of Alice Bale through the UK and Europe, but these days it's open to going anywhere. I think the yeah. Russian painters are so brilliant, but I don't know who'd want to go to Russia in this climate. Sure. But um, certainly the, Ameri um, the American artists are, are very highly regarded as well. Mm -hmm. um, and boy, oh boy, we're getting, we're getting younger artists. <laughs> now, overseas, I look at them on the internet and I think, wow, they're so young and they're so good. Incredible, isn't but it? But they're exposed mm -hmm. to so much more than we've got as Australians. That's right. So we have to get our prospective artists over there. Sure. We've got to expose them to as Absolutely. much as possible. Absolutely. So it's a, the Amy Bale Scholarship is a, a bi biannual scholarship. Biannual. And, yes, the entry's closed on the 4th of That's October right. this year. So It's coming up. Yes. Coming up. Exciting times for it us. It is. It yeah. is. But also to know that those artists who are entering have been working now for probably close to two years on mm. their folio. Mm. It's so, incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Dedication. Yeah. Such dedication. I understand membership to the Melbourne 20 is by invitation only. This results in a society which feels exclusive and not very accessible. Has consideration been given to any efforts for outreach to educate the public about this tradition? Absolutely. And it's coming from within our group. Okay. So um, we have uh, quite more mature aged members mm -hmm. at the moment. It's just luck as it's happened. But um, and we're 19 members strong at the moment. We still have one vacancy, but we're not in a rush to fill that. As I said earlier, it has to be the right person. If we can't think of the right person, there's no point just making the number be more important than the quality of sure, what we're trying to. That makes sense. To or what our belief systems are, um, we are we are determined to have more contact with the public. Um, historically, I think galleries like to maintain their stable of artists and mm. they for business business wise it's in their it's in their to their advantage to not allow us to be too accessible mm. but i think these days everybody's um accessible through the internet and as i said galleries have closed mm. and a lot of artists sell online now they have their own websites um the 20 melbourne we've gone global as a result of covid obviously mm. because we've had to do online exhibitions only over those two years. Um, so we've got a, a bigger, broader viewer now than what we probably did have historically in the past, mm -hmm. purely through technology, I dare say. I didn't say that. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, yeah, but thanks to the internet, we now have, we're now global. Our market of buyers are from overseas as well. So, sure. yeah, That's we're great. definitely spreading our tentacles wider. Um, but it is hard to, to make sure you're getting these younger ones through mm -hmm. and trying to get the message out. We do demonstrations, workshops, tutoring, mentoring, judging. Um, yeah, it's about us getting out and having been seen. Mm -hmm. I, I, we, this recently we had walks and talks. We've had them for a few years actually, but this year particularly was really good. We, we had a lot of fun doing our walk and talks. Um, and I hopefully we are more approachable now. We, we're mm. doing the running of the exhibition ourselves, the society. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we, we want to appear to be approachable, and we're not. No one puts themselves up on a pedestal. So, sure. And we don't like it if a gallery director tries to, because that's not good for our image as educators either. Right. So, so the, the walk and talk. Uh, what's that about? Well. Um, we have two members that do the floor talks and basically we go around the 20 Melbourne's annual exhibition and we pick out two paintings or even just one to talk about that person's work, how they feel, how they work through that painting or what the, um, what they were using tools to use, a few tips and tricks from within the studio, mm -hmm. things that normally stay in the studio might be explained outside. Like you might talk about the model in a painting and what was done to capture a certain light in that painting mm -hmm. or surfaces might vary between artists so it might touch on whether the paint's behaving the same way on this one as it is on this one, what's the weave of the canvas and how that might affect the behaviour of the paint. Okay. So, it's, right. yeah, it's interesting. It's, it can be... Anything from technical information to a bit of gossip about 
who's painting where and who got which model. Sure. Yeah. Now, is those those particular walk and talks are they open to the public? Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, they, and they were two o'clock every day. So okay, yeah, and two two artists doing it at the same time gives quite different perspectives too. So sure. I. I don't mind speaking about other oil painters. I, If I'm going to be talking about another watercolorist work, I hope I don't upset them in what I say, but quite often um, it's the observations of the composition that we might relate similarly to mm. and the, um, or it might be a focal point that we can both, we're both a watercolour and oil or even someone who does something in charcoal can understand when we talk about that focal point being mm more noisy or more finished than, say, the perimeter of the painting. Sure. Yeah. Now, does the Melbourne 20 have a particular base or uh, a particular place where you, you meet at? Well, <laughs> we all love Einstein's Cafe. Einstein's Cafe. <laughs> yeah, okay. not far from the Caulfield Town Hall. But, sure. no, we, we should have a headquarters. And I've, I'm always thinking to myself, would it be lovely if somebody could, a patron of some sort could come and donate us mm -hmm. Um a headquarters somewhere central in Melbourne. But, yeah, it's the one thing we're missing, actually, sure. somewhere that we could have demonstrations, workshops, videoing, um, ex you know, all that sort of stuff would be really good. But sure. at the moment our central base is the Caulfield Art Centre for our annual exhibition. Right, sure. We all work on our own studios at home. So. Yeah, sure. But it would be good if we had one central teaching facility. Mm -hmm. Perhaps yeah. something to you know, consider for yeah. the future. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why are there exactly 20 painters in the society and why can't there be more painters involved? Why not 19? It's just tradition. It's just tradition. 20, so exactly? 20, 20 is doable in terms of personalities. Mm -hmm. um, we've ha In the past, we've had 16 and 15. And as I said before, it's not about rushing to make sure we've got the 20. It's just... The tradition it's been called the 20 melbourne painters not 20 sydney painters or sure so we yeah. all have to come from around in victoria put it yeah. that way um we're not all based in melbourne we've got somebody over at she oaks and shepparton and i'm down in south gippsland but we all tend to come together for exhibitions right. and a lot of those exhibitions are in melbourne and the vic arts was traditionally one of the um galleries that we used to hold the annual exhibition mm. so was mcclellan gallery so mm. we've got history there, um, but it's really just tradition that the, the name change is kind of a, um, it's our trademark. Kind right. Of. So it's never going to be 21 Melbourne mm. painters. It's not going to be 16 or 19. It's 20 Melbourne is the trademark sure. for the group. Um, and as I said, purely based on the tradition. And as I said, we, we've been here over 100 years. I wasn't back. I wasn't around to hear what they were saying was the reason for that, but we've just stood our ground and said, that's it, 20s manageable, we all have different personalities, we all vary in our style of painting, yeah. in our medium, our subject, um, but we're all trained in that working from life academic approach. Sure. And Fantastic. we all appreciate the great masters that have gone before us. Absolutely. So, the Melbourne 20 are also responsible for judging of the Amy Bale Scholarship and provide assistance to Perpetual Trustee in choosing the winner, taking into consideration Miss Bale's will. How did it come to be that the Melbourne 20 are responsible for the judging of the scholarship? Um, well, it was actually Alice Bale herself that um, had the foresight to promote this exhibition as a study um, grant, so a, sorry, a study grant using her own home. So, <coughs> pardon me, in her will, she left her house as I the see. prize. Mm. So, and it wasn't, as I said before, it wasn't until it became so dilapidated and it be, was only land value that it was swapped over to become the travelling scholarship. Um, but I'd have to say, you know, what a beautiful gesture for an artist to leave their home like that, the value, knowing that it's just going to keep going up and up and up and up. Sure. Um, yeah, I think she would, if she were alive today, to see what that was, what her gift was doing for artists today, she would be very thrilled. Absolutely. Yeah. The way you find subjects to feature in your paintings is quite interesting. One day, while driving down Commercial Street in Corumbara, you accidentally scraped the car of fireman Kevin McPherson. Whilst exchanging insurance details, 
you identified that he would make a great sitter for a portrait. As you go on to state, quote, I just automatically knew that's a man who has a face that has got to be painted, unquote. What do you think it was about Kevin's face that struck you so profoundly? He reminded me of Father Christmas. Oh, did he? <laughs> <laughs> Big beard, moustache, and um, he was just a character in himself. He wasn't somebody who was covered in all wrinkles, certainly no wrinkles, because people often say, oh, wouldn't this person be great because they're covered in wrinkles. Yeah. It's not about that. It's There's something else that they've got. A good sitter poses something that's um, quite in your face and could be very unique. If it's too typical, if someone's face is too typical, then it's hard to grab what you think is going to be a mm. strong likeness. But um, Kevin's, I'd have to say that Kevin's probably more hair and just a couple of inches of skin because mm -hmm. he's got he's so covered. But um, I don't know, the twinkle in his eye mm. and that moment when we had to exchange, I could see to him it was more of a nuisance mm. that, oh, no. Like, he didn't really care. Yeah. And I was also thinking to myself at the time, well, I'm a bit scared, I don't know what he's like. Yeah, you know, right, right. And I'm just new in the town and, oh, I've got to make sure I stay on the right side of everybody. So there was a bit of PR work going on there at the same time, but I did notice his fireman's cap okay. in his car. And mm -hmm. I said to him, oh, are you with the fire brigade, are you? And we kind of got up a bit of a conversation, so it wasn't just about me scraping his car. Mm. And I asked him if he'd come around and sit, and he said, oh, I'll have a think about it. Mm -hmm. And I think it was about an hour after he left, he phoned me and he said, yes, I'll do it. Oh, great. So, <laughs> and then um, he did sit here. We did a head study first. Um, I can remember while we were doing the head study, I was actually picturing in my head while I'm painting him in his suburban clothes, the uniform, it was so mm. strong, the yellow. And he said to me, oh, do you want me to get the gear out? Yeah. And I said, yeah. And he could see my excitement. And mm. he said, what if we did it down at the, down at the, fire, the um, what do you call it? The fire brigade. <laughs> the fire brigade's. The station. Station, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, and I was really shocked how generous he was. Yeah. And he went to so much trouble to move. A couple, not just one vehicle. He had to move several vehicles out <laughs> to get the back of the main one with the word Corumburra on it in the right spot. And then he went ferreting around all the old props that were set up around the shelves and boots. He had everything pulled out. He was so keen. <laughs> and I just, wow. The, the, the actual act of setting up a portrait and the engagement you get when you're chasing some idea and to have that connection with somebody else is really, really good. It, it actually helps so much when someone's as enthusiastic. Right. So most people have never, ever sat for a portrait. Mm -hmm. right? It's something back in the olden days through, you know, the, um, the old movies you see, you occasionally get a glimpse of somebody sitting very rarely. Mm. And a lot of people don't work from life. They, mm -hmm. they want to work from photos because it's convenient. Mm -hmm. So to actually have a live model, you know, we're always so grateful, mm -hmm. you know, that people will give up a few hours of their day and just waste that time, literally. Sure. You know, that's what they're, they're literally wasting their time, but they're helping us. Mm -hmm. um, but Kevin was very generous. So we did the small head study and then I, you know, proposed the idea with all the gear and, yeah, it just eventuated. And, and to this day I'm still very proud of that portrait. Mm -hmm. But... Um, as I said earlier, I'm not a political painter. No. This painting was a painting that I could foresee ahead with that bright yellow. Mm -hmm. You know, typically red is a bright colour and a colour you want to have a splash of in your painting. But in this instance, I could see the yellow being so out of the ordinary of what we see in nature, mm. so powerful and strong. And we'd just been through the fires as well. So having those horrendous fires going on all around us, it, you know, it stopped a lot of us getting out landscaping as well, yeah. breathing in all the, the stuff. Of course. So portrait became a bit of a thing for me instead of getting out. And, yeah, uh, between that painting and the Rosie Batty painting, they're probably as close to being politically charged paintings that I would ever do. Mm -hmm. I don't paint to sell a message, a no. political message, but it just happened that, um, you know, through my own experiences, my personal life, I could relate very closely with Rosie to a degree, but um, and it was therapeutic for that the act of painting Rosie in my studio um, was cathartic mm -hmm. in itself and and very helpful for me at the time. 
and the painting of Kevin was my introduction to the community right, here in right. Karambara. Yeah. And I wanted that portrait to be seen mm -hmm. so that I could get to be seen as a local and people thought, oh, well, she's a painter. Sure. So, and everybody knows Kevin. Kevin's been around forever. Right. So there was a connection. There was kind of an ulterior motive there as well and trying to soften him because I just nicked his car. So. <laughs> Great, uh, fantastic story. Mm. Now, the painting was created as a tribute to all the wonderful souls who repeatedly put their lives on hold and in danger for the benefits of the community, and it is entitled Kevin McPherson, Worth His Weight in Gold. It was entered into the 2020 Shirley Hannah Portrait Prize held in Bigart, New South Wales, was the portrait shortlisted as a finalist? No, it wasn't. I was really disappointed. Um, I believe the exhibition went online again only, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to um, spend too much money sending a big painting that size into state. So uh, unfortunately a lot of art shows now are being judged online, mm -hmm. and if you get through the first round of judging, you send your work through a courier right, to the gallery. Right. Um I think as I'm getting older, I'm less inclined to be putting in that kind of footwork. Right. But, um, yeah, to, to be rejected is, is hard. And I think the, the galleries want to have a mix of traditional and conceptual work as mm. well. Maybe my work's too traditional for that. I know it's certainly too traditional at the moment for the Archibald. Yeah. I think you have to be fairly controversial mm -hmm. and... Um, it's not always about the craftsmanship of the artist. It's mm -hmm. a lot about the sitter and whether the sitter's image, personality, uh, reputation can get the crowds in. Mm -hmm. So the style of work that I do, I won't paint to order ever. Right, right. No, I can paint. I knew I was painting for the Alice Bale mm. um, because that was all that all encompassed what my teachings from John Balmain had given me sure so to be able to focus on a prize and aim for it um you really got to be careful what you select and where you want to spend your time sure and what you want to dedicate it to mm -hmm. sure as a side note the portrait was featured in an online exhibition entitled hidden faces the 2020 victorian salon de refuse exhibition and was on view until february 2021 you also painted a second portrait of Kevin to enter into the Archie's Bold Prize, which is a humorous take on the famous Archibald Prize. However, it has a focus on people who have been affected by chemotherapy treatment and related illnesses. It really is impressive how many art prizes you enter. Why do you think it is important for Australian artists to enter into art competitions? In other words, what do they benefit from the experience even if they don't win? Well, just exhibiting, um, knowing you're going to put your work on show means you're going to lift your game. Mm -hmm. You don't, certainly don't want to sign a painting that you're not proud of. Mm -hmm. You don't frame a painting you're not proud of. So if you're going to the trouble of exhibiting it on the wall, you're putting yourself on show, your, how much you value yourself. Sure. So I feel like I want my paintings to sell themselves and speak for themselves without me. Um, if I had to try and sell my paintings without showing them, we, you know, it would be impossible. Mm -hmm. But I think this idea of exposing what you can do, um, it's actually more beneficial for you to see what you can't do when you're alongside other painters that you admire and right. whose work is above yours. Sure. Uh, so that learning happens when you get to see how your work is presented in relation to others. Sure. It might be just down to framing. It might be down to the key of the work, whether it's a high key or a low key painting. By that I mean as in a light painting or a dark painting. Um, it's that experience too of, of going to an opening and seeing for yourself what people like. If you were in it for the money, you'd be at every opening yeah. and you'd be watching what people are going up to, seeing how long they stand. You'd ask people what they think. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not into that personally, but I I do, like other people, obviously you enjoy getting prizes. But mm -hmm. uh, I know the moment you say I'm going to go public, you raise the bar of your expectation. Sure. Yeah, you lift the bench a lot higher right absolutely right. no that's some um, good piece of advice as well for up-and-coming mm. uh, painters in 2021 you created a small painting entitled priceless 
which was very finely rendered and comments on society's struggles with dealing with COVID-19. The painting subject is a roll of toilet paper which documents a time in Australia's history when we experienced a severe shortage of domestic products. This painting is a great example of how a traditional painter can address contemporary issues through their work, although the form of the artwork harkens back to an earlier 20th century tonal realist approach, the subject matter is very much of our time. Can you explain how you approach this dilemma of imbuing your work with paraphernalia that speaks to our day and age while still maintaining integrity to the tradition in which you work in? Well, that's all very interesting what you ask. Um, that toilet roll pa painting was my crossover to the community, um, hopefully not isolating myself but making what I'm thinking available to everybody else. Um, quite often people try to paint things and they don't get the real likeness and you go, well, is it an apricot or is it a nectarine or something? Mm -hmm. So the toilet roll seemed fairly easy. Um, obviously you have to be good at ellipses and the drawing skills come in, but that ability to transcend from being solely in your own studio on your own to making a mark that relates to literally everybody. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if they're just kids or they're adults. We were all in the boat together. Mm. So it was kind of just a topical subject, but the, the way it came about, I have to um, give credit to one of my students who bought the toilet roll instead of a box of tissues to take presses on I her see. painting. Yeah. She had a roll of toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And between us, we both sort of thought of it at the same time. Just put the toilet roll up there. That's a mm. bit of fun. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the beginning, I thought she painted it and I thought, yeah, yeah, just a toilet roll. And then, then the drama about the toilet roll seemed to continue yeah. and it kind of grew its own dialogue. So once this student had left, I decided I'm going to have a crack at it as well. I'm going to do it like a little Dutch masterpiece. Sure. I want it so that people can see and feel how many, how many um, ply that paper is. Yeah, yeah. So the idea, I mean, yes, it taps into sort of a political gesture, I suppose, but it purely was done as a consequence of COVID, yeah. not with the idea of trying to make fun, but it was conveniently just there, sure. sitting next to where we would have set up a still life. Right. And when we plonked it under the, the spotlight and put a little half shadow over it, it kind of took on its own life. Yeah, right. And we all had a bit of a giggle about it. And, yeah, and in the end, I think there was a lot of photo. Uh, images of painted toilet rolls on the internet. So sure. It kind of took off. Right. But yeah, it was, yeah, interesting to to do something that was so simple really in the way it was um, managed and have such a huge effect on people. In an exhibition, the only painting people talk about is just that toilet roll. They could go <laughs> around and look at my other 30, 40 paintings, but for some reason that toilet roll connects with everybody. Sure. And what, uh, what came of that painting? Did it end I've up selling? I've still got it. Oh, you still I've got still it. I've still got it, yes. So it's in your collection. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, your preference is to work from life. However, you also paint from photography at times. Are you able to highlight the pros and cons of working from photographs based on your own experiences using them? Well, my training, uh, um, as you know, was with John Balmain from Life. John Balmain also stated to us that we could do reproduction work but not have it dominate our training. Okay. So, for instance, um, say you're doing a still life and it's a large one, flowers, the flowers will only last a certain amount of time. Mm. So if I was working on a large still life, I would work the subject, the parts of the subject that were going to wilt or die. Um, going to change their position because of the, the heat of the lamp or something. I'd do that first and I would also photograph it in case I didn't get to finish it. Sure. So anything that's stable, like the vase, um, the backdrop, I don't touch those too much. They're just going very basically blocked in. And then I work the, uh, the parts that are in the focal point and the parts that are going to change. Right. All right. So there's a benefit to having that photo back up. The other thing is um, if I was to get a commission of children, so a child, they don't see it so no. straight away to the photograph. I don't sure. hesitate. Um, and the, the older person who might fall asleep. But 
Um, the other thing is in some conditions you can't paint in for very long. No. So I might be painting out of the snow and I'm painting some people in the distance that just looks like a bit of noise in one spot mm -hmm. and it just becomes calligraphy and yeah. they're gestural strokes. And it might be that I take a photo and I look at the photo later and I go, oh, I wish I'd got that done a little bit more. I'm just going to do a few tweaks on it and use the photo to back it up a little bit more. Right. Usually it doesn't work. It's always better when it's painted a la prima, mm -hmm. wet in wet from right. start to finish. If you can go back home into the warm environment and touch it up, then that's fine. But it never works when you come back and work on it after the painting's dried. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It becomes a different ball game. Absolutely. The paint behaves very differently the second time around. Sure does. Absolutely. I understand you advise your students to go to art galleries and museums to photograph artworks, specifically cropping photographs of the finer details. How has this practice helped in the development of your own work? Well, I particularly encourage my students to go and take close-ups now that they're allowed to, because historically you weren't allowed to photograph works in the galleries. As mm. I said, you're not even allowed to go really close to them. Sure. Um, but if you've got a camera and you've got a zoom lens, you could, don't have to be really, really close. No. Unfortunately, a lot of the lighting is not conducive for, for us to study something in close detail. Right. A painting might be up too high, mm. all right, and you want to see it close. So the camera, you can aim the camera up if you've got a pivoting lens. Mm. You can take the photo. You might have three or four cracks at it, and then you've got to um, try and get the spot that you want. So that's where it's helpful to get up and see stuff closer that right. you can't see that when it's not at eye level. But also, the old, in the old days, as John Balmain would say, um, you'd have an image in a book. You go to a gallery and it looks completely different to what you saw in the book. Sure. Right? In a book, you've only got a, a restricted size. But on our phones, we can zoom in. Yes. And then you can see the graininess, whether that's a coarse weave, a, a, it's a fine, smooth canvas, yeah. whether it's double or triple primed, um, the thickness of the, the paint, the direction of stroke and whether they were right-handed or left-handed, whether the stroke was heavy at the start and dragged off. Sure. Those sorts of things you can't see in a, in a book. Right. All right? But you can zoom in mm -hmm. with your phone, even the mobile phones are pretty good these days. Yes. My advice, though, to anybody who wants to do that is take the photo and then look at it next to the artwork that you've just photographed. Yeah. Don't go home with it and then think, oh, I don't know if it looked like that. While you're there, adjust it. Go into the edit function and edit it so that it's got the right contrast, the right colour temperature. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Those things are really important. And it can be that you went in and you saw so much in that exhibition, you've come out and you've got artistic indigestion. Yes. It's just yeah. too much. Yeah. And then you might think, you know, a couple of weeks go by and you go, oh, I remember when I was at Bendigo and I saw, let's have a look, I go scroll through and I find it and I go, yeah, that's what I need to do on this portrait. Mm. And you zoom in and then you zoom in a bit more. Yeah, I might zoom in, screenshot it, and then zoom in a bit more. Yeah. You lose a bit of the clarity, but sometimes that zooming in, and it deletes all the other stuff that you weren't interested in. Right. So there's no distraction. But, you know, in a, in a way, as much as I have this aversion to technology, I'm still very grateful that these phones in our hand can take us anywhere right. in the world to all those beautiful, incredible galleries around the world. But that idea of being able to see close up, into stuff is really valuable, which we couldn't do sure. when John Balmain was alive. I mean, he would have loved to have had that opportunity to have zoomed in on, you know, the night watch sure. really that close. And usually the photographs you pull up on Pinterest are the best quality. Right. They're always better than if you stand in the gallery anyway because mm -hmm. when you stand in the gallery and take it yourself, um, you've got people walking past, you've got shadows and glare, you've got it might be too high. Right. So on the websites or if you just Google Rembrandt's Night Watch. Yes. You'll get the best version of That's it. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, a lot of people nowadays will complain about, you know, we spend so much time on these digital gadgets and such, but they do have their, their benefits. There's, there's merit to them. As well. Yeah. Yeah, sure. On-site sketching in galleries and museums is something which you also encourage your students to carry out. Can you explain your approach for this practice? Well, you have to get permission yes, to start course, with. Yes, yeah. um, my idea of doing copy work is actually in oils. 
mm-hmm. in front of the real painting. So you have to seek permission and you have to have references from other people to say you're trustworthy enough. Um, and there's always got to be a gallery attendant next year when you're painting. Yeah. So I know when I was doing um, copy work in London, uh, I had to get permission before I left Australia. Mm-hmm. And then I was given a certain time frame and I had to make sure that I was in London at that time. Um, and just standing in front of, say, <coughs> a Coro landscape and looking at it for hours and hours and trying to work out how he did it and understand that, hang on, if he painted that, he, uh, he had a certain amount of time on it. Sure. There's no point you spending weeks and weeks when he might have only spent three hours mm. on it. So by being able to go up close and looking into that paint, the depth of paint applied and the types of brush stroke, again, you know, you can't see that in a book. The value comes from actually being there. And when you're in that, those beautiful, you know, world-famous galleries, that's an experience in itself. You get sucked in and say, oh, there's a Coro, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one. Mm. Oh, hang on, I'm just going to stay in the Coro room or I'm going to stay in the Rembrandt room today. And you only get a limited time to copy. Mm-hmm. So the benefit happens when you go in there and you walk around and you might go back to a painting before you're going to start copying it. You'll go in and out three or four times. Right. And so you might decide, well, I haven't got time to do all of it. I'm just going to select the hands or I'm just going to do the face. Yeah. Or just a small bit, whatever's at eye level, because you don't want to be painting something up there. Right. That they're not going to move for you. Sure. Uh, If you're lucky enough to eye off something that's um, been moved into the conservation rooms, yeah. you may be able to get a special space down there to, to work, mm. which fortunately I was able to to arrange with a, a Rayburn portrait. Oh, great. So that, that was good, having it removed for cleaning and mm-hmm. then I have it in the conservation room perf- like perfectly set up. I, I couldn't ask for any more. All to yourself. Yeah, all to myself. Fantastic. Yeah. Lovely. To improve understanding of individual facial features, you encourage your students to draw the same part of the face from a variety of references. How have you found this exercise improves your students' skills in drawing? Well, I I ask my students if they can look at different artists they admire and then look at how they've interpreted the work. So um, some artists might be extremely detailed. Uh, you might see every hair on mm. the, the eyelids or in the, the eyebrows. And then there are other artists that have very little detail mm. and it's purely just based on um, minimalist tone work that's, that oozes the atmosphere. Mm. So it doesn't mean that you have to paint every every inch. Some paintings you might have half of the face in shadow and half in light and I might say, well, all the, these I might produce all these images of famous paintings and I, they're all got an eye in light. Right. And I say, right, we're just doing eyes today. And and the next time I might say, well, we're all doing the eyes in shadow. And they go, but that's only going to take me five minutes because mm-hmm. it's only it's all in shadow. There's no detail required. Sure. So there's an understanding there of how do you explain edges, mm-hmm. what's going to be detailed, what's going to have a sharp edge, what's going to be a soft edge. Mm-hmm. And that understanding happens by showing them different variations on that yeah. by different artists. Right. So, I mean... Those individual artists might vary their technique from painting to painting, but Mm -hmm. there's always parts that I'm drawn to that I think, gee, I wish I could do that better in my own work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a look at how um, Sir John Longstaff did that. What did he do on the mouths? Mm -hmm. How does he make them look so soft with no hard edges? Sure. So let's go and zoom in and see what he's done. Absolutely. Make them bigger than life in the photo so I can really see how many detailed strokes did he put? Or it looks like he's got a rag and he's just smeared that across. Sure. Yeah, that, that's why we're doing the detailed studies. Absolutely. And the more you do of them, the more you know what to look for. Like the V, is the V deep? Is it shallow? Yeah. Um, is, uh, is the nose, does the nose kick up if it's a side profile? How far forward is the tip of the nose from the forehead? Sure. You know? These are things that are individual characteristics. We all have the features in the same place, mm-hmm. but they vary so slightly on, on so many people. You, you can look for that V and not even see it. Mm. Um, we talked earlier about the eyebrows. That That's a classic one of whether they're short here, long there, or long there, short there. Sure. Um, the little 
divot here mm. um how close to the fulcrum it, it, can you see it is it in shadow does you only see a little snippet of it right these are important things that people miss unless you've painted a lot of features sure sure yeah. they Absolutely. just most people just look for the overall the hairstyle and the clothes mm -hmm. but when it comes to the nitty-gritty we're looking at just that sure and and you've got to do a lot of them mm -hmm. to be able to get it right mm -hmm. and that's the likeness absolutely Repetition is the mother of skill. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. You encourage your students to purchase the best brushes and canvases that they can afford. Why is this necessary? Well, a good tradesman doesn't blame his tools, but That's a good important. tradesman doesn't work with toilet brushes. Sure, So, sure. I mean, it really does come down to what you can afford. I'd rather students have fewer brushes but make sure they're all really good quality. Mm -hmm. A really good quality large brush, a large flat brush, mm. has the ability to work small detail as much as big large slashes if it's kept in good condition. Right. All right? So if you pay more for your brushes, you're going to look after them. Sure. Well, yeah, so, that's true. And, and as I said, you don't, you mustn't be blaming your tools. Mm. You know, that's just a cop out and excuse. Sure. Yeah. If, if anybody said to me, oh, I couldn't do this because I didn't have enough brushes, or, or was my brush was really up, it's just an excuse. That's right. It's not good enough. It's an excuse. I've got plenty of brushes. Mm -hmm. you use mine. Sure. If you haven't got this color, why didn't you say? Mm. I've got plenty of it. Right. Yeah. Right. That's not a good enough excuse sure yeah. so are you using with your brands of brushes these days uh, an assortment of brands or do Absolutely. you just stick to one no 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 it's i mix it up and i have favorites that i keep going back to as sure. well unfortunately um we don't have the availability uh, like we used to of the holbein brushes yeah. they were really beautiful brushes mm. and i used to get the filberts and the rounds but I have a few of those still left and because they're good quality they do last a long time mm -hmm. Um, with paint, in regards to the paint quality too, if you buy the artist quality, you have them for longer. Mm -hmm. They just have more miles. Right. Uh, the oilier paint um, or the say the transparent colours can have a lot of oil put in them. to right. fill it, they, they fill it out with oil. Mm -hmm. The higher the price of paint, you expect to have more pigment that's in true. them. That's true, yeah. yeah. Um, that's not to say that they don't, they're don't. they not transparent. Transparent colours should remain transparent. Mm -hmm. And I know when the recipe is being mixed with because they take on this opacity yeah. and the colour's not as dark. Sure. You know, sometimes if they shift the factory overseas, or the, you know, I generally try and work with brands that I trust, like, oh, I hope you don't get my Ugg boots in there. <laughs> um, yeah, I like to work. Windsor & Newton I favour because I went through the factory Yes. Uh, the manufacturing factory in London, and that was quite a privilege to get that opportunity. So uh, naturally I um, I like working with Windsor & Newton because I know the consistency of the paint. Absolutely. And they, they don't change the recipes ever. Mm -hmm. um, I like the Michael Harding because the paint's quite buttery and Art Spectrum have some really good um, earthy colours and mm -hmm. I, I'm a great believer in use but there's probably about four or five colors that you must have in artist quality mm -hmm. and they're generally the synthetic colors right so we can't make the primary colors so you've got cad red um cobalt blue uh, and cad yellow mm. you know you can't make those three primary colors no. so the primary colors i'm um, i'm always saying to people you know buy the best you can afford sure. the earth colors it's not so important but you know you should really be if you take yourself seriously you'll buy the good quality and what you can you, you get less but just make sure you've got the right quality for the what you hope to achieve right all right well said well said fiona you have mentioned in the past that something which good judges at portrait competitions pay particular attention to are hands that are very well painted indeed hands are a challenging subject to capture accurately how have you developed your ability to draft hands more truthfully in your time well, uh, this happens over a long time. Each finger is a little miniature painting. Yes. Each digit is like a miniature still life. You've got to treat it as if it's just any other part of the body, but you've got to spend a lot more time on it. Right. All right. Um, unfortunately, life classes don't have enough a long time mm. for students to study the, the whole body and get the hands in relation. Mm -hmm. So my advice is always to, if you're at a life class and you're failing in your drawing of hands, you need to study the hands more. Right. You, know, you don't have to worry about the rest of the, the, the figure. Try and do hands and feet. You might have the worst position in the life class 
and you've got a foot staring straight at you, mm. just do the foot. Mm. You know, um, as I said, each bone start to end, that's one little painting in itself. Yes. Five, five, you know, plus all those individual joints. You've got to allow yourself enough time, mm -hmm. all right? And I mean, you can look at drawing books that talk about the rectangles and how they, the perspective mm -hmm. of the things that get shorter, get you know, the, the vanishing points come together. Be closest to the picture frame is going to be foreshortened. I mean, these are all standard, typical um, trainings that we learn. Yes. You've got to... You've just got to put the hours in. You've got mm -hmm. to do them. Even if you can't paint. I know when I have my surgeries, you know, I can't stand for long. I'll just sit down and I might just draw my hands. Yes. Um, and it might be that you draw yourself drawing. Mm -hmm. That's one of the hardest things to do, to actually draw that hand with the pencil in it. You're copying it. You're looking at it. You know, you're training your eye still to see. Sure. It's still just visual observations. Sure. But there is a lot more involved in mm -hmm. hands. And I think, you know, if you see a, a pair of hands painted really well, you can guarantee the face is already good. Yeah, absolutely. All right. It takes more time to do the hands and they should be considered important. A lot of people will put the hands in the pockets mm -hmm. or that avoids the fingers. Sure. I've been known for that mm -hmm. quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but to truly do... To, to understand hands, plaster casts of hands are good. Yeah. Getting your neighbours, family members just to model, just to mm. sit there, and you just keep drawing them. Sure. Just do as many as you can. Um, practice, practice, practice. Absolutely. Yeah. That's it. Practice yeah. makes perfect. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting that hands, although the, the anatomy is very similar, they all have their unique characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. You might have a hand of a, an accountant, they yeah. look very different to a hand of a bricklayer yeah. or, or something. Absolutely. So on and so yeah. forth. Absolutely. A particular quote of yours which demonstrates your experience and wisdom as a painter goes as follows. Quote, what you do on your canvas really does count from start to finish. Don't think for a minute that, vo that by momentarily becoming slack that your mistakes can be overlooked or covered over by a thicker paint or detail. I always feel that a sign of a good painter is when the artwork looks as though the painter has not struggled with any area. It has to look cleanly executed or more importantly look deliberate. It needs to look confident for a viewer to feel confident about it. The longer I find that I take on my own work, the more likely the area I am painting starts to look dead. When you first start a painting, try to ask yourself, can I imagine the subject on my canvas painted? In other words, can I visualize the end result? Unquote. Now, your basic approach to painting follows five stages. Composition, tone, edges, color and texture. Common tools that you use include a mirror and black glass to reverse your composition. The floor is marked so you are standing in the exact same spot every time. All colors are arranged in their usual order on your palette, preferring to use a limited palette that is exhausted to achieve every tint and shade possible. Tubs are available for dry brushes and another for the used ones. Cobalt dryers are sometimes used to speed up drying time of paints and clove oil is also used at times to slow down drying. You believe in keeping brush strokes broad as the finer details should only comprise 5% of the painting. Considering, that, considering what has already been outlined here, can you provide a summation of your painting process including how you start through to the resolution of the picture? Okay, there's a lot in that. So starting out, it is always that first impression that you get quite quickly that draws you to a feeling in the painting. So for me personally, it's setting up a subject, whether it's a still life or a portrait. My um, degree of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, creativity, it sort of stops after I've set the model or the subject up. So I figure the composition part, when I'm panning along looking for a view with my viewfinder, I'll stop and I go, wow, that's it. That's the composition. Mm. So I don't flirt with composition after I've got it set up. It's Once it's set up, it stays set up. Mm -hmm. And the idea is nothing should be moved until the painting's finished. Sure. All right. Um, 
the starting point of my painting, I, I always like to go back to that idea of eliminating the biggest differences. So if I've got um, a primed canvas, it might have a tint on it or it might be a white canvas. That is the biggest difference. So I start off, I cover the surface and eliminate all of that white because nothing I can put on that canvas is going to tell me an accurate reading if I'm only comparing it to white. So I get rid of the white and I do a tonal map. So the tonal map is um, where I just use the minimum colour to explain the lightest light to the darkest dark and what happens in between that tonal range. Yeah. Um, by stating the darkest dark and the lightest light early, we've established the boundary that other colours have to be mixed within. Um, and it's important that you don't give too much space to the darkest dark or the lightest light. Mm. So like um, minerals, you know, gold's expensive because it's rare. Mm. So, you know, if you use too much of your highlight, it becomes less valuable. Mm. It doesn't relate to what's around it. So you have to have the right combination of quantity to those tones mm. for them to relate accurately to each other. Sure. Um, so starting off with a rub-in. So that establishes the composition. The rub-in for me, I'm, I have to say, is so fun to do because it establishes the tonal range, mm. stains of colour. I say we, we're doing stains of local colour, so that's something within the ballpark of what the colour scheme generally looks like. Um, I generally put the paint on darker than I think it's going to finish up. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea is not to put on dark again. Right. All right, we're working from dark through to light in the rub out. Unlike watercolours, they start with light and work up to the darks, mm -hmm. always preserving that white paper for only, you know, that moment when they need to leave all of the white. You hopefully don't have to go, oh, I've covered it and I've got to get rid of it. In oil painting, you there's a little bit more um, sensitivity and forgiveness for oil painting. Mm -hmm. But I still like to say from a teaching point of view, starting with dark darks and rubbing out the lights gives you your composition, your tones and your uh, um, attention to edges. Sure. All right? If you don't do that method and you prefer to draw on the, the canvas, be it pencil or even drawing with a brush, you tend to have a lot of sharp edges that you've then got to go back to and undo. Mm -hmm. So the method that I work with is um, – cover the canvas and use the rag. The rag, it's hard to achieve sharp edges unless you shove the rag over your fingernail mm -hmm. or over the blunt end of a brush or something. So that first rubbing stage, it hopefully cements the composition and the atmosphere that you're going to create. And then the next process, of course, is mixing a set of tones in colour mm. that match the tones that you've achieved in your rub out. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you don't vary that too much and you're just applying colour and then after that, that's probably about 80%, 80%, 90%. Yeah. And as you said earlier, that, that last 10%, say, is the detail or the calligraphy, sure. the little um, interesting carrots that, that you dangle in front of the viewer. Mm. So it might be that it, it could be just figures on the beach and they're just gestural blobs. You know, they're not, there's no detail to them, but right. it's what I would call the calligraphy stage. Sure. Or a highlight down the tree trunk or something that's put in with the edge of a palette knife. Mm. You know, they're fun things to put in, mm. but they're not actually the essential component of the painting. Right. Tone, areas of size and shape of tones in approximately the right colour mm -hmm. is what's going to hold the painting together. Right. The calligraphy at the end is the bonus that, sure. that gives that bit of finish to it that makes it more personal so very true absolutely do you varnish your paintings i do yes um i'm very meticulous about the darker paintings being varnished because yeah. the darker tones can dry dull and and which in the end becomes lighter than what it was when i painted it wet mm -hmm. so the varnish is a leveling of the painting. Mm -hmm. um, retouch varnish does that and it's a temporary varnish and can be used in between stages if mm -hmm. the painting's dried in between. But um, I like to varnish every painting. It, 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 it helps level the shininess out. Sure. But it also preserves the paint. Absolutely. And it can be cleaned off down the track if something spilt on it or whatever. Sure. So Great. Yeah. As for paint brands, I understand you prefer Windsor and & Newton and Daniel Smith. Have you experimented with different paints over the years? 
And what is it that makes you settle on the aforementioned brands? Well, the consistency of the paint, the thickness and thinness, the transparency of the pigments is really important. Mm. Um, I always say to students that you should stick with a brand that you like, get to know how the paint behaves. If you keep swapping brands or you keep swapping canvases and keep swapping brushes, you've got to relearn how that product behaves. Mm -hmm. And each product behaves differently when it interacts with another product sure. or brand. Um, you might have a favourite Cad Red. You know, I might use an Art Spectrum Cad Red, but I might prefer Bright Red or Windsor Red in the Windsor & Newton. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm happy to trial everything, but it's got to be artist quality and some artist quality paints are different than others. Mm -hmm. They're not always the same. When you take the caps off and you've got Cad Red, Winsor Newton, Cad Red, Art Spectrum, Cad Red, Michael Harding, they can still look different. Absolutely. Yeah. And then if you don't get the opportunity in the shop to do that smear test no, to test. No. But, I mean, I have the benefit that when I've been teaching for so long, I know what products are supposed to feel like. Sure. I, and people come in with a stray new product and I get to test it with them. Mm -hmm. um, there's not very often is there anything that new on the market that's going to be superior to Windsor & Newton. No, absolutely. And I'm pretty loyal because I went through the factory and I watched those big vats with their their blenders. The paint being mixed. Mixing, yeah, yeah. Sure, great. Your preferred medium is a mixture of linseed oil and white spirits, which is used sparingly. Have you experimented with different mediums in your time and what has made you choose this particular mixture? <coughs> Pardon me. Well, that's a fairly typical traditional mixture. Mm. And from my teaching days with John Balmain, that's what he used. Sure. But at university, we I remember we used to have to mix up a shampoo bottle, an empty shampoo bottle, and we had a third Damar, a third Terps, and a third linseed oil. Mm. Um Depending on the drying time that I'm hoping to work within, it, it could mean that I have more terps if I want the terps to evaporate and get away from that rubbing stage. When I was doing my demo, I had two dippers. One was different from the rubbing to when I went through to the, the second half of the painting. Mm -hmm. The rubbing, I prefer to use the white spirits because it does evaporate on the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to rub off. Right. And it doesn't necessarily attract the dust and dirt. Mm -hmm. If I was to use just linseed oil, um, it's like a magnet to the dust and fluff and things floating around in yes, the air. Yeah. But also can take a lot longer to dry, which assists my style of painting. Um, but what I find, the amount of uh, viscosity that I'm working with is deter that is relating to how thick I want the paint to leave the brush and stick to the canvas. Yes. All right. Paint originally, was it's designed to not have to have anything with it. Mm. Right? You've got to know what you're trying to achieve before you decide to put a speck of medium into your paint. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you want it to flow really watery like or do you want it to go on like butter or paste right. um, or clag, um, impasto? So you only add medium when you know how that paint behaves anyway when it comes out of the tube. Right. All right. I know that the darker tones can dry very dull. Mm -hmm. So I always make sure I have a bit of oil of some sort in there. Sure. All right. Um, ivory black is one of those inks or dyes that are very, very hard to rub off, off of even a pure white raw canvas, mm -hmm. very hard to rub pure black off. So if you were to use pure black for a rub in, You'd have a lot of, you need a lot of muscle power yeah. and a lot of terps. Mm -hmm. All right. It's not good because terps makes paintings crack. Yes. So um, ideally, you never want to use terps as a medium. You mm -hmm. want to use it to wipe your palette down, clean your brushes, maybe thin something down that's got Dama or linseed oil, something in that's going to bind it. Right. All right. right. Um, again, like the brushes and like the canvas surface, what you put in that paint is changing the way the paint behaves, mm. all right? It's a lot to think about, but just know in your head that the paint is designed to be used mostly as it comes out of the tube. Right. And adjustments happen because you choose to make the paint behave differently. Sure. Fantastic advice, mm. Fiona. You have a particular way of stretching your canvas, which is very practical. Instead of stretching the canvas at 90 degrees with the weave in line with the frame, the canvas is stretched at 45 degrees. 
so that the paint is kept soft on the edges of the forms by the way the brush reacts to the weave being on a different angle. Can you explain this approach to stretching canvas in more detail and its benefits? Well, uh, painting on the diagonal, that's what we're talking about here. Um, it was actually Sir William Dargie that advised me to have a good look at some of the Rayburn portraits in the London National Portrait Gallery. Um, and that was the first time I actually saw the diagonal weave being used. It is a fairly expensive way of working with linen, though. I mean, to wrap canvas around a stretcher arm, you have you do waste a lot mm. of canvas, all right? So a lot of my work, I don't wrap over stretches now. I just glue it onto um, a MDF surface. Okay. Or I prime the canvas myself with a texture primer. But... Um, in terms of painting on the diagonal weave, I do find it prevents a lot of sharp edges happening without consideration. So um, there's a softness about the paint and the, the way the paint behaves touching the diagonal weave is quite different to what it looks like when it's on a just the vertical and horizontal. Sure. All right. Um, and even more so if you're on a very open, coarse, coarse weave mm -hmm. canvas. Um I'm not a, averse to experimenting with surfaces. I prefer to work on linen, but I do prime my own boards if I want an unusual texture or mm -hmm. I want something with a bit more tooth to it. Sure. Um, was there a part two of that question? No, that, 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 was, that was pretty much it. Yeah. Um, so uh, just moving forward, you have mentioned that you find portraiture to be the most satisfying of all subjects to paint. However, what captivates you to paint a particular picture is the play of light around the subject. I understand 95% of your paintings are done fairly quickly with the last 5% taking the greatest amount of time. You find that the more time you spend in a painting, the further away from your initial vision you become, which acknowledges the fact that less can sometimes be more when it comes to painting details. Do you feel as though a painting becomes overworked with the more time you spend on it? Well, yes, I do, actually. And if I'm spending too long in one area, it means that I've missed the mark in the beginning. Um, I like a painting to look like it's not fiddled with. Sure. It's got to look spontaneous and fresh. And the longer you spend or the more brush strokes you take to get something right, you've usually lost the, the clarity of the tone or the colour or the drawings shifted out further, mm -hmm. which is a problem. So... That uh, the idea that you paint a lot less but with more consideration it leaves you with a fresher result. Right. And a lot of people it, paint in one spot for too long. And from a teaching point of view, watching students, I've seen people just hang around one area and they can get up to like 15 strokes in that one area. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, stop, stop, what are you doing? And they, they don't know. It's like they're are they painting just to fill in the time mm. or are they painting – do they think that doing more strokes, what they didn't understand is miraculously going to come to their head if they spend a bit more time doing it? Yeah. No. <laughs> or is it that the brush is magically going to unload more paint? Mm. No. Or is it because the paint's not leaving the brush, There's no. they need to put a bit of oil in it? Sure. Uh, there's lots of reasons why people do that. But for me personally, I like to study something and then go in and strike and make my decision mm -hmm. and hopefully stick to it. Right. If I do that consistently and I'm really studying, I shouldn't have to move things around too many times. Mm. In fact, you don't want to move anything at all if you've got it right and you've measured and you've followed your rules and abided by the training. Each time you paint, you should get better and better and better. Right. All right. It's one of those professions where time years and years of practice actually do make a big difference. Sure. Right? There's some careers or professions you can do where you train a minimum amount of time and then you stay in that profession your whole life but you don't really acquire more knowledge. You mm. might become more efficient time-wise in doing something but painting over years and years of dedication, you do change, you evolve, your work can become tight at some periods and other times it could get looser. Yeah. Um, eyesight can change the way you see things. Sure. Um, you might be a still life painter in the beginning but you become a landscape painter. Mm -hmm. So I moved down to um, South Gippsland. Well, how on earth could I survive down here and not do landscape painting? Right. You yeah. know, it's, it's just a given I'm going to get out there and paint this beautiful scenery. Sure. So... It's, it's all relative, all relevant. Absolutely. 
I understand drawing in the tonal realist tradition is usually done with a brush on canvas during the scrubbing stage of the painting. Refined drawings are not really emphasized. This is something which differs to the 19th century academic tradition, which places heavy emphasis on refining drawings to resolution. What is your opinion of the two approaches? Well, I think, firstly, I'd say that the academic approach of good, strong drawing is really important. Here we go back to the Meldrum School and the, the split from the Meldrum School away from the other Victorian Artists Society. Yeah. Meldrum used to say to people, to his students, that you don't need to be able to draw to do this. Mm. But as I said earlier, he's neglected to mention his years and years he dedicated to drawing over in, in France. So um, for me, from a, the perspective of a teacher teaching um, pe beginners, a lot of people would come in and they'd say, but I can't draw. Mm. I don't want to do this because I don't. I can't draw. And mm. I have to say, well, you might think you can't draw, but a drawing uh, um, by definition is line. Right? If you look it up in the dictionary, it's delineation of line. But painting to me is blobbing and dobbing. And it comes down to blobbing and dobbing and scrubbing in the right position. Mm. Your drawing skills are always working. You're always comparing. Yes. All right. So whether it's a pencil or it's paintbrush, these are observation skills. Mm -hmm. We're just using the drawing skills and they're being executed with paint. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me personally, drawing and painting is, is really the drawing stage of a painting is in the composite, the early stages. Right. Now, the other thing is if your subject is going to die or wilt, go off, mm. you only have a certain amount of time to capture it. Right. You've got to ask yourself, is spending a lot longer on perfecting the minute details in the drawing, is that going to be at the expense of the atmosphere and the finish? Mm. Or could it be that if you don't, your drawing, your observation skills aren't good enough to be able to pull it off if you don't have that detailed drawing? Sure. All right, so there's, it's, it's a bit of a, an open-ended question because it depends on the ability of the person and whether they've had a lot of experience drawing in the past and not much painting. Mm. From a teacher's point of view, I must say I'm always surprised at how well people, beginners, do the drawing part of the painting. Yes. When they're doing a rub out mm. from a, 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 a canvas that's been toned down already, mm -hmm. the, the fragility of being able to get the drawing right isn't there. Mm -hmm. and they're not so scared of it. And I talk my students through how while you're doing this rub out, we are dealing with the drawing skills. Yes. Of Just so you haven't got a pencil in your hand. That's right. I still value drawing, strong, good drawing, and I think life drawing keeps you fluent in that, but it's not the be all and end all mm -hmm. from my point in a teaching circumstance. Sure. I don't want to scare people off too. And people know if they can draw or they can't. Mm -hmm. um, if they're good, really good at their drawing and that's all they've done, that could actually impede the progression in the painting because they might paint really tight yes. with too many sharp edges. Yes. So, you know, the Meldrum school and philosophy is that you paint as much as you can in the shortest amount of time, yeah. with the least amount of detail, the least amount of paint required and the least amount of energy spent doing it. Sure. And only when you've, you've studied and you are skilled can you actually do that and pull it off. Mm -hmm. Right. So... There's, you know, it's it's a it's a curve. It's a big curve you go over when you're starting from a beginner and you get to that point where you think, I think I can frame this. Yes. I'm going to sign this. Sure. And having said that, I want to make a statement here that I think is really, really typical of the philosophy of the teachings of the Meldrum School. There's four stages of learning. Yes. And it was my beautiful teacher, John Balmain, who said this to me one day. And it's the four stages are unconsciously unskilled. You don't know how bad you are. Mm -hmm. Stage one. Stage two, consciously unskilled. Uh oh, I've just learned a bit and now I realize how bad I am. Mm -hmm. Stage three, consciously skilled. You have to think about it and you can pull it off. Stage four, unconsciously skilled. You 
can do it while talking and demonstrating and it just rolls off the brush. Sure. Right? That's what we all aspire to. Um, so they're the four stages of learning. And to actually enter into a teaching setup and hand yourself over, you have to be really humble and say, I don't know how to do this. Mm-hmm. I know someone who does it better than me. I'm going to go and I'm going to pay money to them. Mm-hmm. They're going to teach me. Sure. Whether you find the right teacher or not, you know, there's a bit of luck in that and, and timing, of course. So um, you need to know what it is you want to It's hard to know what you want to do if you don't know that information, mm-hmm. right? But by going to exhibitions and seeing the 20 Melbourne, looking at Camberwell, Pinterest, just Googling, sure. you know, that's all helpful. It's all part of your study. Mm-hmm. You're absorbing and looking at things, yes, like it, no, don't, move on, move on, oh, that's just led me here. Ah, I didn't mm-hmm. know that I liked that. Sure. You know, there's a lot a lot we don't know Absolutely. That, we've, that we've still got to learn. Absolutely. And, you know, as soon as you think I know it all, well, it's time to turn off the lights and That's go right. find another hobby. Well, to make art, we must know art. Uh, well, yeah, and it's like everything relates to everything. Sure. Yeah. Now, you often look to the best artist for inspiration. A painter who you particularly admire is the Australian Sir John Campbell Longstaff. What is it about his work that inspires you? Well, Sir John Longstaff was our Australian version of Sargent. Mm -hmm. So Sargent's known to be one of the greatest portrait painters of all time. But I think around the same time period, we had Sir John Longstaff doing similar things. They did meet. They... they, um, John Longstaff travelled quite a lot and there's collections in some of the public collections you'll see paintings that he did of other areas overseas. But I spent quite a significant time at um, Shepherd and Art Gallery a few years ago. They did a retrospective on Sir John Longstaff. Okay. And I was very lucky. I asked to have permission to photograph the works and amazingly they said yes. So I did zoom in and I took detailed close-ups of the features and I was also able to go and do copy work in oils in mm-hmm. the gallery. Sure. So um, having spent so much time looking close up to so many long stuff, they're all beautiful. They're consistently high quality. Mm-hmm. There's not one dud amongst them, as mm-hmm. with Sargent. Um, some artists, <clears throat> pardon me, you know, they have the famous name, but the works might not be consistent yes. throughout their whole yeah. careers. But I would have to say that Sargent and Longstaff just blow me away. They never yeah. missed. <laughs> yeah, every everything they did had a. It was very highly considered, proportionately relevant, um, very of the times as well. I mean, even today, there's a modern element of application of paint in Sargent's work and. Longstaff's work. Sure, they're not detailed, flowery, fluffy paintings. No. They're very dynamic, highly considered and charged paintings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and all done from life. Absolutely. And, you know, you got to admire the the speed that they would have to paint, the amount of concentration, the timing of everything, mm-hmm. everything happening, have, having to work in that moment. Yeah, that's that's a planned effort. Incredible. Planned effort. No luck involved. Absolutely. True learned skill. Absolutely. It's really mind-boggling when you uh, take your time to think about it, yeah. all, all that goes into mastering the craft yeah. of painting. During your travels to Europe, you were also influenced by the early painters of Britain and Spain. What is it about their work which captivated you? Wow. Um, well, the authenticity and consistency of it. Um, originally, before I'd travelled through that scholarship, I only had the, re- the references in books to look at. So there was quite a lot of artists who I already knew about that I liked on the small mm-hmm. image. But when I actually got to see them in the flesh, it was a whole new ball game. Mm. As I said, I could stand in front of a painting for ages and ages and annoy people who wanted to have a look and, and I've been there too long or sure. I've got up too yeah. close. But that was so necessary for me to do that. Um, the Spanish artist, well, Velasquez, of course, was Meldrum's predecessor Mm. so Meldrum studied a lot of Velasquez Mm -hmm. and Velasquez um, was famous for painting the visual order and the visual sphere that Mm. that we have in focus so if you look at a lot of the Velasquez portraits 
you notice there's not a lot of strong detail, mm. but everything falls into place at a certain distance. You can your brain fills in the gap. Yes, um, and that's what's really important. But up until Velasquez, we didn't really see a method applied that showed the order of visual importance. Mm -hmm. And Velasquez paintings, when you see them in the flesh. You can actually see the order that mm -hmm. he puts the paint down in. He doesn't take things too far for the purpose of the viewer. Mm -hmm. He's just capturing what he sees in the order of visual importance, which is Max Meldrum's theory. Right. Now, um, Max Meldrum took the knowledge that he got from looking and studying at the, the Velasquez paintings and he put it into a teaching method. Mm -hmm. So he put it into this book he called The Science of Appearances yeah. and he talks about uh, tone being the king of all the design elements to painting. Mm -hmm. And Velasquez, Sargent then followed, of course, and you've got Longstar following in exactly the same pathway. Sure. So those painters I gravitate to because that was what my teacher was teaching me. Right. And he did throw in the names of those artists when yes. we were teaching. And he had the books out to show me examples. Mm -hmm. Um you know, we, if there was a blockbuster exhibition, we'd go to it. Mm -hmm. He would take me out to Castle Main Art Gallery and we'd have a look at, you know, the old Heidelberg School painters. Yes. And i go, that's exactly the same way that Sargent painted. He's got a similar one. And we'd go back and we'd pull up books and compare. Yes. Um, yeah. And that led us down to what type of brushes they must have used mm -hmm. or did he paint that as a sketch or do you reckon he spent hours and hours on it? Mm -hmm. Well, he couldn't have possibly spent hours because he'd only painted from life. Right. Yeah, so he's helping me find their processes. Sure. And by going in and doing copy work directly in front, that's another level of understanding that you get right. from it. Right. It's a, it's a journey, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Constantly yeah. finding pieces of the puzzle. Yep. And the paintings that you copy are the ones you remember. Yes. You might have favourites in the books. No. But if you get to go and do the copy work in the gallery with your oils set up next to it, you'll remember that painting for the Absolutely. rest of your life. That will stick the, with you. The same as going out plein air. You'll remember locations on huge world trips Yes. according to where you painted. Absolutely. And the conditions that were on the day, the crowd or the, um, the wind blowing, yeah. the cafe that you were waiting to have open because you'd been painting all morning. Sure. You, know, you remember those spots. You remember those faces that you've painted. It's an experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, speaking of Maldrum's book, do you actually own a copy yourself? I do. Oh, fantastic. I do. And That's I great. acquired it in a most unusual way. I bought it from the arts bookshop, mm. High Street Armadale. Yeah. And I was still, I was a student with John at the time. And he told me that, he showed me his copy and he said, you'll never get it. <laughs> he said, you, if you get it, you might as well buy a tax lotto ticket. That's right. Anyway, I found it. Yeah. And I, every time I went into bookshops, I would ask and I got that question, you've got to be kidding. The mm. answer, you've got to be kidding. Mm. And one day wow. I got a phone call from the arts bookshop and they said, you know that you had a book on order that you wanted us to find, we've got it. Wow. And I got it on the train and I went up all excited. And when I got there, of course, I didn't have enough money. But she told me it was $400. Wow. It was a hard copy, signed, numbered, and had a few colour photograph plates in it. Anyway, I went back and I told John Balmain and he said, you know what, you can't afford to not have it. Oh, wow. Okay. And he said, if you want the money, I'll lend you the money. And I said, no, no it's all right. I'll, I'll find a way. And then my mum loaned me the oh, money. great. And I got the book, got it home, and I started reading it. It was a bit difficult for me to understand, but now I look at it, I could read it again and again and again, and every time I get more out of it. Great. The more you know, the more you understand mm. what he's trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, but this particular book, I decided I was going to ring the phone number of the name written mm. in the book. Wow. And it was June Hobart. Oh. She was 20 Melbourne painter. Yeah. So I got on the phone and I rang and I said, um, I'm just ringing to find out if you were a student of Max Meldrum's. Mm. And she said, well, actually, there's a funny story to that book. I'd like to meet you and um, would you be interested in coming to my studio? Mm. I thought, oh, student of Max Meldrum, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, I'm going. So and we make an, a, a date and I go over and... We're chatting away and she said, I, I'd, I'd like to paint you. Said, Have you got time to sit? 
And I straight away said, yeah, of course yeah. I have. So five sittings later, wow. going over every weekend, and in the end I wasn't that keen on the portrait and I didn't have the money to buy it. Mm. But um, we, we'd got a bit of a rapport up and she said, right, well, we need to make a decision about this book. And I thought, oh. She said, well, the book was stolen from me. Oh, was it? So technically the book is mine. And she said, but I like you and I think you're going to get a lot more out of it than if I keep it. Okay. She said, I'd like you to have the book. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Yeah, so that's how I got my copy. Wow, what an interesting story that yeah. is. Yeah, um, they were so rare to find mm -hmm. and my teacher, John, he had the leather-bound edition. Oh, wow. So, yeah, that was, would have been a good find back then. But they're, they're a real detailed study on his philosophy mm. and his method of teaching. Yeah, it would be something Very to, valuable to spend some time with teachers. that. Yeah. Definitely, absolutely. Coming to your, your studio, uh, Fiona, now your studio is quite, uh, quite something and now you started obviously with the studio in Rosebud mm -hmm. and then you moved to Corumbara and now you've got your studio here in uh, Corumbara. It's, uh, well, one thing that you mentioned earlier on today was that, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a space that's constantly moving and mm -hmm. you're constantly adjusting. Would you like to comment on that? A little bit about your studio yes. space and how you work in your studio. Well, the studio itself is is so important. The position of the light in relation to the easel, the amount of shadow that you can create, the length of shadow, they're all things that are really important. So the height has to be there to enable those long shadows. Um, the quality of the light is is important. I like to have the same light on my subject that I have on my canvas and on my palette. So the spread of the beam has to be able to reach all of that. I know a lot of painters say bring in another light to light the palette, but it cha changes the temperature. Mm. And I think painting's hard enough anyway without having to chase something that doesn't exist. So you set your subject up to replicate exactly what you want to have finished in the painting. There's no point changing it halfway or having a dark background that you painted a mid-tone. Yes. Yeah, I mean... Uh, let's make the job as easy as possible and mm. just do it really, really well. So I always say set up your um, still life so that it's ergonomical for you. Mm. You don't set your subject up and then have to turn around behind you to get to the paint. Sure. You know, everything has to be laid so that out so that you are easily, you have easy access to everything. Mm -hmm. Um the size of the space you have to be able to see at a glance step back far enough that you can see at a glance the edge of your subject on that side to the final edge on the canvas mm -hmm. without having to go like that right all right so that determines the amount of canvas the size of the painting determines how far back i'm going to have to have my observation point sure so and this is the, the point where i stand back to measure mm. and i always have a straight arm that's right never a bent arm no Right, and as I said earlier, the mark on the floor is actually a physical mark. It's mm -hmm. not just a bit of tape no. that you can see. I don't want to be looking down. I want to actually feel it with my feet so I can keep my eyes up and keep that fluency going. Did John teach you that? Uh, I think it was more working with the kids, yeah. actually, <laughs> and the kids taking so long ferreting around trying to find a tube of paint. Yeah. And by the time they've found the paint, I've moved on. Yeah. Um, so I think the kids have taught me a lot about economy, mm. economy in time, economy in quantity of paint put sure. out, um, finding shortcuts to stop the delay of the finish. Mm -hmm. And I, I always wanted the students to leave with something very close to being finished. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't concentrate for the whole time, um, hopefully they didn't blame the setup or blame something else. It was down to them. Right. Absolutely. So, Great. Yeah. Now, regarding your daily work routine, can you provide an outline of what a common day of work looks like for you? Mm, that's a cruel question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when I'm painting consistently, when I have a time frame, like I might go through a couple of weeks or months where I get the time to paint, um, I generally don't paint before, say, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, I go in a hyperbaric chamber for two hours most days, and that brings me to about 11 o'clock. But before that, um, I might need to go down and pick my fruit from the supermarket or get the freshest stuff I can find or 
I might be out looking for something to put into a portrait, a piece of furniture or something. Um, I might be doing ordering picture frames or looking for entries for art shows. Mm -hmm. I might be doing judging. Um, so the, the morning really I put aside for my housekeeping kind of stuff. Um, I like to – sometimes I don't even start painting in the, in the, to brush to canvas until about 1 or 2 o'clock. Mm. And I tend to paint right up until around 10, 30, 11, even past midnight sometimes. Wow. And it just so happens that I'm not interrupted at that time. Mm. I'm not needed by anybody to be anywhere or, you know, collect anything. That's the time. And the evenings is when I find I can concentrate a mm. lot. And I've had the morning to think about things and – I've got everything set up so that I have the best chance to just literally flog it. Sure. So painting a la prima, wet in wet, I might spend from midday to midnight or even longer. Wow. And then I'm so exhausted. The next day I'm like I have to put the painting in the freezer mm. because, and I've got a chest freezer kindly donated to me out the back. Mm -hmm. um, if I plan to go on it for the next day, into the freezer it goes, but I always mix my colours again the next day. I don't tend yeah. to save because mixing the paint is actually that, that oxidation with airflow mm. is what's making the paint tack off. Sure. Um, so I might spend, it's not really a nine to five kind of five day a week job. Mm. I work till I can't stand on my feet anymore mm. and um, try and set myself up. Um, with a calendar where I know I'm not going to be interrupted for two or three days mm -hmm. when I'm doing a major work sure. because I might be able to extend the drying time by putting the painting in the freezer to make it malleable, workable for three days and then after that I have to let it dry mm -hmm. because there's a, there's a tacky stage in the middle which is not very pleasant to work with. Mm -hmm. It either has to be still wet so I can paint wet into wet and rub off or I come back and that next stage is slow going. Sure. So when I say the first bit happens while it's wet, that's 85, 95% of the painting. Mm -hmm. And I'm just dead on my feet sure. at the end of those couple of days. Right. Then it takes me a couple of days to recover. Mm. Might do a lot of reading, researching, um, internet stuff, speaking with other artists, liaising with the 20 Melbourne we have the ex annual exhibition every year, so there's a lot of work mm -hmm. going into that. Sure. The planning for that is already started for next year, wow. even though we've yeah. just had our annual exhibition. Um, teaching when I'm able to, um, my classes, although technically they're supposed to be two and a half hours, they're often three and a half, four and a half wow. hours. Um, but I spend a bit of time recovering too from surgery. So sure. Uh, I've had a bad couple of years, actually. I've had been inundated with surgery after surgery. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that today I can paint and I can stand. As you know, we've deferred for a few years. Two years in the making. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, hope it's worth your worth the wait. Absolutely. And we get a good result. Absolutely. Um, but typical, yeah. The, an artist's lifestyle is not typical. It, no. It's pretty unique. And it's a privilege, mm -hmm. really. It's not a great way to earn a lot of money. Mm. But um, I once heard a teacher say to make a lot of money, you've got to use your brain. Mm. And if you're a craftsperson, yes. you'll be doing it for the love of it. Yeah. And sadly, that is often the case. Yeah. You've got to find a good gallery or a manager. You've got to stick to your guns with your, you know, your process and your integrity. So much goes into it. Sure. Are you currently represented by a gallery, Fiona? No, I was with Jenny P and okay. Fine Art, and she was fantastic, but she's just retired. So mm -hmm. the 20 Melbourne now, we're all basically back on our own and mm -hmm. work. we're endeavouring to find galleries, but unfortunately a lot of them have closed. Sure. So, But yeah. I, I will always exhibit with the 20 Melbourne annually. Mm -hmm. And there's also rotary shows that are starting to pop back up again after COVID. Mm -hmm. And I try to exhibit locally if I can. Mm -hmm. And there's a few exhibitions like Camberwell um, that I'll enter. There's shows from where I used to live on the Mornington Peninsula. I try and enter those sure. again. But um uh, um, my output hasn't been so good. I, I've really had a couple of years where I've gone months and months mm, without painting. Sure. So reading, teaching, 
um, studying on the internet, you know, all of that takes its place at certain mm. times. And the other thing, of course, is the seasons. In winter, I'm not doing landscaping. No. But yeah. I'm inside. I do my, a lot of my portrait work where I can get models in the winter. Spring, like now, is really great for still life because mm. there's a lot coming up in the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all relevant. Absolutely. Now, being a full-time painter is indeed a great achievement which must require a great deal of perseverance and hard work. What has your experience been like thus far earning a living and trying to support yourself through painting? To sum it up, blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a lot of generous people have supported me over the years. So um, there are times when you're, you're doing really well. You can have an exhibition and maybe sell half these days is a good exhibition because, as I said, you know, trying to sell work today when everybody's a, an expert photographer or, That's right. you know, everyone's a painter these days. Um, it comes down to a lot of planning, mm. yeah, and being really careful and miserly with your equipment, what you need to do. And when I paint, I'll put paint on a little thin strip of a timber Venetian and I'll preserve that, put it in the freezer so I don't have to, to buy too much of it. Okay. Um, I try and economise wherever I can. I mm. don't roll my canvas around stretch of arms because that's a lot of canvas wasted. Mm. Um, yeah, and, I mean, and again, time is money. You've mm. got to find ways to support yourself. So teaching in the studio, that's one way of supporting myself, entering shows and hopefully trying to pick up an art prize sure. again. Um, commission work comes by on occasions and it's about making sure the person purchasing the work is not buying it as a bit of decoration no. to match their decor. That's right. You know, the serious buyers are the ones that will research the artist they're going to choose. Sure. And there's a real um, strong connection there between what the the buyer is aiming to achieve and what that they know that that artist can produce. Sure. Um, yeah, it's 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 hard to survive these mm -hmm. days. I must mm -hmm. say, um, I used to survive with my school teaching. Mm -hmm. I, as you know, I was a school teacher for a long time in the public system, and that's a guaranteed wage. You don't have to chase clients down for money. Mm -hmm. It's just the education department's pretty reliable when it comes to pay. Mm -hmm. Um, but these days, you know, since I've moved down here, um, yeah, my health's taken a bit of a turn. So sure. I'm back back on the strong now. But sure. it, you know, it's, yeah, it's year by year. Sure. So I'm always grateful that I can stand for as long as I can when I when I can. Right. Now, if it had if it came down to the point of uh, you had to earn a living solely off the sale of your paintings, is that something that could be viable? Or no? Not today. Not today. No, you've got to sell paintings. You've got to teach. You've got to demonstrate. Judge. Um, I mean, I mentor a lot for nothing, and judging these days is not exactly highly paid sure. either. But um, you know, it's hard. It's really hard. Absolutely, it it's, is. Not something a lot of artists like to talk about either because we do struggle. You know, we want to buy, buy the, the best quality materials mm. and to uphold the integrity of the 20 Melbourne, you know, I want to work on the best materials I can afford. Sure, so sure. I'd rather sacrifice other areas of my life. Yeah. I, and I don't buy brand new clothes and I certainly don't go out clubbing and I don't live with a bottle of wine in the fridge. Okay, you know? sure. I'm not a pauper but... Um, I'm fairly miserly in how I spend my earnings mm. and I'm always really, really grateful and appreciative when I pick up a prize. Sure, so. sure. And and saving money, is that something you've been good at throughout your life? Um, yes, I have been in the past, mm -hmm. but I, I'm i very lucky in that when I sold my house in Rosebud, I, I managed to have some money left over to live off to be able to support myself building the studio again and trying to start off. Sure. For teaching again but I've decided these days as I've got older and I've had all this joint replacement stuff going on um, my teaching is minimized now mm. and I'm more I would say I'm more selective about how I spend my time between whether I can paint or whether I teach and I also need to have some space outside the studio yes of course so I mean um, I love my animals and I love my gardening as well. And they're equally as important for my mental state. Mm. It's very hard to stay in that position of concentrating at 100% for hours and hours and hours every day. It's not normal 
You know, That's right. everybody doesn't do that in their normal day to day work. So you have to balance the physicalness of you know, moving around, mm. you can be standing in one spot for hours and hours and hours and you th- your whole body's not really getting a workout. But yeah. you, go, you go in at the end of the day and you're really stiff and sore. Yes. All right. So there's so much involved that the average person on the street has no idea. Mm. You know, there's this image of bum artist, beach bum, yeah. someone who doesn't do a real job. Yeah. And that's a hard, a hard pill to swallow. And I get why people think that. Yeah. And unfortunately, to do this really well takes a lot of time and um, patience, Mm -hmm. practice, Mm -hmm. and a lot of that is unpaid. Sure. So there's a sacrifice you have to make to Mm -hmm. do that. And uh, unfortunately, you know, as time goes on, I'm realising that people don't value the amount of time it takes to do a piece of work. Sure. And when people stop by me landscaping on the side of the road and they've maybe seen me set up mm. and they've come to watch at their very end, oh, how much would you get for that? Yeah. And you know they want to buy it and yeah. they don't want to say how much is it. Yes. Right? And, you, and then, you know, the only answer I can give them is, oh, well, it's about $800. It's about 36 years, and you know, in training. Yeah. You know, yeah. they don't consider that it might be half an hour's work. Mm-hmm. But there's decades and decades of training That's and right. sacrifice and lifestyle adjustments that I've made to be able to pull that off. That's right. Yeah, you know, and sometimes, you know, I hear people go, oh, what? Can't be worth that much. You've only spent, you know, and I was like, right, here's the brushes. I'll set the timer. You've got 20 minutes. There you go. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. They don't realise the um – the, the, the blood, sweat and tears that, That's it. that went yeah. into getting you to that particular point yeah. where you can um, uh, replicate nature yeah. to that level. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Now approaching the end of the interview, what is your opinion of the state of tonal realist painting in Australia today? I think we're on a resurgence and I really hope so, but I, I, my gut instinct is we've seen so much modern abstract expressionist work mm. and I... Um, this is going to sound a bit opinionated of me and and maybe a bit mean to some, and I don't mean to offend, but I feel like a lot of that work is purchased from a decor Mm. point of view, people matching what fits into their home. Sure. And unfortunately, um, you know, some of our home renovation shows are the worst culprits at promoting that when they say you two can have this on your lounge room. If you go to Bunnings, we'll give you the exact paint will give you the pattern to trace, blah, 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 and everybody's suddenly a brilliant painter. Right. Um, that's, that's one of the contributions that I don't agree with. But then you get a lot of younger people that are much younger than when I started looking into paintings of the old masters and wanting to study, wanting to go to Charles Cecil Studio and um, the Florence Academy. These are great. They're, it's terrific. I want people in Australia to know that we have that knowledge base Mm. in our 20 Melbourne Painter Society. We're an older demographic of people. I'm one of the younger ones, but um, this is why the Alice Bale is so important. But We find people to train up and hopefully come back and be part of this society that Mm. is so determined to pass this knowledge on and keep it going. Sure. It's got to stick around. And... Um, you know, we're a relatively new country. If the other countries that are so much older, if they, if their population is still gravitating and appreciative of the old masters, what's missing here? Mm-hmm. You know, it, right. it has to be taught and it has to be, we have to be able to get exposed to it. Mm-hmm. We have to be able to go to galleries and see these masterworks. Yeah. And, I mean, Rotary shows are very helpful, but um, we still got to get into the, the regional galleries and national galleries. Mm-hmm. And education in this tradition is yep. necessary. And the young ones, you know, I so wish we could keep the younger ones. Like um, the teenagers are the yeah. best. That's the best age to get them into the studio and start getting them to see this approach, sure. this comparative analysis. Mm-hmm. It, it affects the rest of their lives. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And um, historically it was the age that a lot of the, the yeah. masters did start. Yeah, they became apprentices to others before them. That's yeah. right. What advice can you provide for aspiring painters out there who are trying to solidify their presence in the world of Australian realist painting? Stay humble. 
humility will get you a long way. Mm. Um, you know, don't let your ego take off. If you sell a painting, it doesn't mean that you're going to be that style of painter. Sure. All right, you have to stay open-minded and I continually say look at the great masters, study the great masters and read their biographies, find out how they started, what their influences were. And when you start doing that reading, you start seeing a pattern and you see a pathway that you can then say, well, hang on, that's I could probably engineer that pathway for mm -hmm. myself or I appreciate what they went through, but things have changed today. Mm -hmm. Put it in perspective. Yeah. Um, I still am very much in agreement with John Balmain's um, ticket of advice to me, which was get that bit of paper mm. because I can't say that taking the path of, of just doing artwork is going to give you a living. Mm. You need su to be supported with family and friends and, you know, future clients to buy your work. It, it is hard to survive financially as just being an artist. Absolutely. Right? If you're really good at it, you will want to pass the knowledge on, mm. all right? There's a lot of teachers out there that are teaching because they don't paint now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like to be the best teacher, you should be practising. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it, it helps to be practising as well as teaching. And my students give me as much as what they think I give them. Yeah. You know, uh, they keep me on my toes. Mm -hmm. And I always want to be better than them. I always want to make sure that I've got something that I can show them to convince them that it's doable. Sure. You know, you can't get blood out of a stone, but you can certainly try and encourage and persuade people to go in directions that they may not have considered in the Absolutely. past. Absolutely, most definitely. Yeah. Be open-minded and always be grateful for the opportunities that come along. Sure. And, and, and actually take them. That's great advice, Fiona. Now, in conclusion, looking towards the future, what would you like to see happen to the state of realist painting in Australia? Well, I think we need the revival to get really big. Mm -hmm. I think it's time that um, the education of these young ones is geared towards good, solid foundation understanding. And I think that's been missing for such a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, education costs money and it takes time. But unfortunately... Today we don't have the practising artists in the classroom doing the teaching yeah. and, and it's a shame. We need life experience and kids these days, they need to know what's involved and they need to be realistic about what, what it is they want to do for a career. Sure. Now, if they really are so tunnel vision down this path, then they're probably going to be quite good at it if they get exposure to the right stuff mm -hmm. and the right teacher. Mm -hmm. All right, there's a lot of luck in it and timing but those that are really really determined they probably will do all right mm -hmm. and but to be the very best you've got to almost be a bit insane a bit, <laughs> a bit out of the box and, yeah. and it might be that I am one of those out of the box weirdos but um, hopefully logic and humility brings people back to the ground sure. and, and you've got to stay firmly on the ground and realistic about what you're trying to achieve how long are you going to take to achieve it too? Mm. You know, people often think, oh, I'll go and have some lessons with Fiona and then I'm going to go and start selling my portraits. Mm. Yeah. Well, if they can do it that quickly, then you should be teaching me. That's you know, right. That's what I say. So, you know, it's a privilege to do this and as I said, there's a lot of kindness from other people that assist me to be able to do what I do. That's fantastic. You know, it's, it's not easy um, financially, it's very hard, but if you really want to do it, you find ways mm -hmm. to do it. You sure. become really good at teaching. You teach those that the other people don't want to teach or mm -hmm. um, give them give the students more than what they're going to get from other people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great Bring advice. Bring them along for the ride. Great advice, uh, Fiona. Now, um, considering that we're currently in September, almost at the end of mm. 2020, are there any other workshops or exhibitions or related news that you would like to announce for the remainder of this year? Um, well, no, not so much this for this year. I know the long weekend, the Melbourne Cup weekend, often brings about a lot of exhibitions, a lot of shows, mm. and uh, pretty close to closing off time for those ex um, shows now. So I'd say keep your eyes open for the Rotary shows. 
Um, and also any of the long weekends like the Easter long weekend, Australia Day weekend, Queen's birthday, or oh, no longer Queen's. Mm. I don't know what's going to happen to it's that. It's going to be interesting. I don't think yeah. we'll get a King's birthday. Who knows? See what happens. Um, but, no, the calendar for the rest of the year, I've actually got a couple of landscape commissions to do. Okay. And I've got a big portrait that I'm wanting to do of my partner and I think that's going to be a, a major work. Um, there's a bit of judging that I've got to do and I'm always mentoring people. Sure. So I've got a terrific um, gentleman who's entering the Alice Bale that I've mentored for a few times in the last year and a half mm -hmm. and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that he's going down the right path. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, the, the rest of this year is um, I'll, I'll probably be, I hope to paint nearly every day. Sure. I'm on a good roll at the moment with my body, so I'm going to try and do something every day. Right. Yeah. Great. That it means great. sacrificing some people's visits. Yes. And um, but it has to be done. But you got to be protective of your studio yeah. time. Yeah. 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 The time is precious, and people don't often understand why I find it easier to paint in the evenings. And mm. somebody dropping in and saying it's just me yeah. might upset the balance of the day. Sure. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, um, as we mentioned earlier, the, the Amy Bale uh, Scholarship is uh, happening this year. Mm. And um, <clears throat> just in regards to your own opinion, uh, any anyone who should be keeping an eye on this year? Oh, I don't think I'm allowed to say, <laughs> but I am, um, I've got a couple of people in mind. Mm -hmm. um, one that, I, as I said, I've men I mentor. He hasn't actually had a, a lesson as such. Um, look, there's a couple of Melbourne students that are doing very, very well that I've heard about and I've noticed on their social media. So there's the, we're, we're getting some coming through finally. Great. It's typically gone to the Julian Ashton School, but Absolutely, thankfully always, now usually, yeah. um, the 20 Melbourne are now being recognised as teachers themselves Great. and we do follow in the same tradition and the academic training. So, um I think I, I would always say pick a couple of shows that you know are going to come around every year and just mark them on the calendar. Sure. So, Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, um, Fiona, how can the audience uh, find your work online? Do you have uh, Instagram and uh, website? Um, I do have an Instagram account that someone else is managing for me at the moment. Okay. So um, be patient. I try to have things posted from time to time and not have a big big gap. But, um, yeah, I might get periods where I post a piece each week or it might be one piece I'm working on over a couple of months and it might take a while to post. Um, I'm not really big on social media, but if you wanted to look up um, information about how to contact me, you'd go to the 20 Melbourne Painter Society website. Mm -hmm. um, There's your website. I don't there? have my own personal website. Oh, you don't? But okay. um, each of the members have a page. Mm -hmm. um, we're included in the overall the annual exhibition, so you can click on any of the works and that will yeah. send you off to more. Um, yeah, we're just coming into our own That's great. You know, in terms of IT, thankfully. Sure. Is there a email address that you'd like to share? Um Oh, I suppose I could. Sure. Um, it's actually been through word of mouth that most people find me. I don't okay. do a lot of advertising. That's fine. Um, but if anybody wants to contact me, you can contact me at Dawnwood Studio at Outlook.com. Great. Well, Fiona, I just wanted to say thank you so very much for this great experience, inviting me to your studio to get to witness you working to get to witness all these amazing paintings on the walls and hearing your story, which is which is ongoing. Obviously, it's, it's not over yet. It's still got plenty of living yeah. ahead of you, but it's been uh, it's been an education. And I just want to say thank you for uh, maintaining such a high standard uh, in uh, Australian tonal realist painting and for maintaining the integrity of this tradition mm -hmm. for as long as you have. Uh, it's not easy, as you've mentioned throughout mm -hmm. this interview, but um, it really goes to show how, how dedicated you are, how passionate you are about this craft. So thank you very much. I, I really do appreciate the, this opportunity. Yeah, very welcome. Thanks, Amelia. Look, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present this too because it is quite um, a sole occupation. We're often on our own mm. and it is harder to get ourselves out into the public when we have to work in such a controlled, solitude 
sort of environment. Right. But yeah, thanks for the opportunity. No worries. Hopefully, thank you lots much. of people get lots out of this, and I'm sure it's a, bit of a, a bit of a window into how Absolutely. we survive great. or don't. <laughs> great, great. Well, thank you again. Yeah. Fiona, and hopefully we'll catch up again Terrific. in the future and I'll see how uh, your work is progressing then. Thank you. Nice, no thank you.